Um, good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. I believe it's November. Um, it's 6 p.m. and we are, this is the Gloucester School Committee and we are meeting at Gloucester High School, 32 O'Johnson Road, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by remote participation. The public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when necessary. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star 9 to request to speak. If you're watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during all communications to be recognized to speak. Um, I ask, I will um, state that the mission of Boston Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. And I ask that you join me with a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, for the record, we have Superintendent Lummis, um, Assistant Superintendent Amy Pascarello, uh, Member Laura Weeson, myself, Kathy Clancy, Member Bill Melvin, uh, Mayor Greg Berga. Um, Samantha Watson will be a little bit late and she'll be joining us here. Uh, joining us remotely is Keith Minio, and Maria Puglisi, our Recording Secretary, is here. Um, okay. We will um, move on to oral communications. If there's anybody in attendance that would like to speak to us um, under oral communications, now is your opportunity. Okay, seeing none. Um, comments from the chair, I'm gonna just make a quick comment. I know the superintendent last meeting Thank everybody for a lot of the hefty topics we've been um, handling and discussing and moving forward over the past few months. And I just want to thank everybody for such thoughtful and professional and, and really good um, good operating as a committee. Um, we may not always necessarily agree, but I do find us all very respectful and, um, and really focused on what's best for children. So uh, let's keep that up. Okay. Um, Recognitions. Do they have any recognitions? I, I want to recognize uh, Mr. Melvin, Kathy um, Kat Clancy, and Melissa Teixeira for going to the uh, and, uh, Massachusetts Associated School Committee and School Superintendents Joint uh, Joint uh, Conference last week. Is there anything you guys? Have it is great to go together. I'm sorry I wasn't there. Uh, next year, I hope. Um, anything you guys want to share about just being there and being with a lot of the school committee members and superintendents? That's what it is. Uh, I thought it was very well, you know, the conference itself was well done, well put on, a lot of great breakout sessions. I, I met a tremendous amount of people that were well versed in school committees and uh, and I just thought it was really valuable as a school committee member to be there and uh, be with other school committee members throughout the Commonwealth. So, really enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, I thought their agenda and all the topics that they covered mm -hmm. were um, particularly helpful. I mean, that is the professional development that we that we have as members. And um, sometimes you sit and you, you know, you realize that our district is doing so many things well and that our committee is functioning really well. Um, so that's always a nice validation of, um, of the work and how we approach the work, um, both from the superintendent and all the hard work that goes on from um, you know, educating our kids to the way and roles that we have within it. Um, and it really is nice to connect with people from other, from other districts and figure out what they're doing. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to a couple people about how they're doing their meetings with people physically attending mm -hmm. the meeting. And the key is their local cable TV filming. Um, yep. So that's kind of the way that has been they've been able to do it because it, but the technology is just different, right? Um, but anyway, it was um, it was a good couple days. So I was there for a couple days. Yeah, if I could add one more thing, Ben. Um, one of one of my takeaways was how impressed I am 
without patting ourselves on the back and how good we are procedurally. We do we do things very, very well. We're listening to other school committees I was in. I think we got that covered. We do that pretty well. And, uh, that, I said that a bunch of times to myself. And, uh, I was really impressed with that. So it's hard. I mean, I've seen, I work in a number of school committees, you know, and a number of communities, and it's hard to, it's hard to know that until you hear, as you said, care from other folks and hear from them. But it's something that, that this community, at, at the, you know, since I got here, has done very well. I mean, obviously before that, but, but what I know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'll just add one more thing too, because a lot of the, they have um, general sessions, um, sometimes one in the morning and one at, at noon, and the real important topics in education right now, and to hear people that kind of are more are experts or, or have been asked to speak on those topics are things that are all reflected in our district for an ongoing improvement plan, um, and things that have already been brought along. Um, so. That's another validation that we are addressing right now. Thank you very much. Um, I will recognize the girls' field hockey team, which is in their second round of playoffs outside at Mill Stadium. And when I left um, to come back to the meeting, they were up one nothing. I don't know what it is now, but let's all send them good vibes. Um, it's a really good team with a lot of talented kids, and let's hope they can. I heard a cheer as I walked in. Oh, oh that's yeah. That yeah. was for you. That was for you. They said one, two, three, Gloucester, so. <laughs> okay. Um, Can I do just a quick recognition? Sure. Uh, since you guys are talking about school committee meetings, um, I, I, I found work going on the mayor's meetings has been great, and, and I've got to know Kim Driscoll pretty well, and just want to give the congratulations to our colleague, a, a mayor and a school committee member. Now going to be the lieutenant governor and having somebody in that office who understands the roles we're in it is going to be really beneficial for us that's great okay um next we have our gloucester high school student advisory council and i see chloe the guest Bobian on our call thank you chloe for coming tonight hi good evening um, so this past weekend at the Crane Estate in Castle, um, Castle Hill in Ipswich, six GHS students were selected to show their work for the annual Crane Estate Student Art Show sale. And Gloucester's Ali Nicastro was awarded the People's Choice Award. The GHS theater program has their fall play, Clue on Stage, and it starts next week on November 17th, Friday, November 18th. Saturday and November 19th, and tickets will be available on their website or at the door. The mental health ambassadors will go downtown next Wednesday to introduce their local, to introduce to our local businesses the work that they're doing and inviting them to participate in supporting the Green Bandana campaign or advertising a sticker for all to see. Our guidance counselors have submitted over 500 pieces of application material to colleges on behalf of class of 2023 students and over 60 college admissions representatives have visited GHS this fall. The baseball and hockey teams are both hosting food drives for the open door now through November and the baseball team will be picking up at houses and bringing the donations to the open door. GHS has raised over $1,600 for 47 Thanksgiving baskets to donate to families in need. Um, 14 female students from our local vocational programs, the carpentry, auto, electrical, and advanced manufacturing, visited the electrical union to see how girls in trades and had the opportunity to, su to succeed this today. Um, the senior class had their semi-formal Monday night and it was very successful and enjoyable. And GHS will be hosting their annual blood drive on December 9th. Um, could I show um, the the, foot, the artwork that um, Chloe mentioned? In the oh, first sure. Thing? Yeah, I actually have uh, photos of that from uh, teacher Emily Harney. Um, Chloe, thanks for sharing that. First of all, if you just hang on, I'll, I'll show this on the screen. Here we go. Uh, you should be able to see this. So this is uh, Caleb DeCoste, a photo of Caleb DeCoste. Folks will re might recognize that scene. Right here. And then this is from Emma Allen. That is a, beat, a, a waterfront scene, but I don't think Gloucester, seeing it's a pelican, but you never know. 
Uh, it's from Janet Church. This is all photography. Uh, uh, Brady Sullivan. Truly Dowd, <laughs> right, and that's Truly himself as well. Um, that, that's a photo, um, if I can zoom in or not, um, but that's at Shail Shail Lu. Um Yeah, so we recognize that. Again. Oh, wait a second, hold on. And the last one, um, which I think Chloe said was an award winner. Zoom in a little bit. This is um, Alan Castro. I think that's her grandfather, but I'm not quite sure. That's uh, that's that's um uh, that's not a photo obviously, but it's a rendered uh, artwork. Which is, I can see why that was a award winner. Very nice. Yeah. So great, great work um, by our students, the support for the teachers as well, obviously, um, and really wonderful for them to be not only shown but recognized as well. So thanks for bringing it up, Chloe. Appreciate that. Thank you, Chloe, for being here. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, next item of business is the consent agenda. Does anybody have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we'll call vote, Maria, please. Uh, Ms. Wiesen? Yes. Chairperson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. And Mayor Verga? Yes. Uh, we move on to deliberations on education issues and the superintendent's report. First up is. I'm going to give a little, a uh, few just um, uh, news items. Okay. And then uh, Ms. Pascal will take. Uh, going to take us off on who we're talking. Um, I'll share my screen. <clears throat> So, uh, like we like to say, every day matters here in Los Angeles schools, and everybody belongs. And um, so tonight, just going to give you an update. So, as folks know, yesterday was a, uh, a day off for students, which means uh, in professional development day, we have it every year, typically on election day. And often, a, a professional development day for families is more of a quandary and a question. Uh, what, first, what am I doing, going to do with my, with my kids? And two, what what are those? What, what are the, what, is, what are teachers and the school staff doing, and why are they doing this to me? Which, um, as a for, as a parent of younger kids, I, I understand that. You know, and it's sort of in the middle of the year, there's this, this, this day break, right? Well, just to want to help educate the committee, but also the public. Um, yesterday was a fantastic day for so many of our staff. Um, first of all, um, it was incredibly well organized by Greg Bach. He's been doing this for years, and this is um, sort of his last hurrah. This this professional development day. There were over 70 offerings and a couple of things on that. One, um, the alignment with the plan for ongoing improvement was uh, was impeccable. Uh, just a really great alignment with, and, and, and what that means is that a lot of really important work on instruction, instructional improvement, curriculum design uh, at all levels, pre-K through 12. Um, at uh, O'Malley, so, so pre-K through eight folks were mostly at O'Malley and then high school folks were a little bit at O'Malley but then largely here. Um, and so at O'Malley, you had, uh, for example, um, teams uh, in each grade, uh, the social studies units. Uh, you had the English, English teachers who continue to work on their piloting of their um, new English, uh, as they determine what the new English curriculum will be. Um, you had uh, work on social emotional issues. Um, I'll talk about one in, in, in a moment um, with Lynn Lyons. Um, but also, you know, real sort of uh, granular but very important ones, uh, behavior and autism, uh, self-care in the classrooms. Um, uh, 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 an important piece that continues the ongoing work at the high school around instructional improvement and was uh, teams of teachers worked in small groups on lesson planning and uh, sort of sharing lesson planning, sharing a lesson and getting feedback from your colleagues on that. And that's something that um, is sort of new or hasn't been done in high school for a little bit. Um, so the folks did a real, really nice job with it and sort of supporting their colleagues in sort of develop, uh, addressing a sort of dilemma that they had about a lesson they're developing or working on. Uh, we also worked on um, communication tools and communication outreach to parents and families. 
um, and then also a, a number of social emotional er areas. I'll show some, some photos. Uh, and then one last piece, which I'll get to just to, is all staff have the opportunity to work and, and listen to Lynn Lyons present. Um, I'll show more about her in a moment, but really, really powerful lessons, guidance, suggestions, information around um, supporting students with anxiety. And anxiety on the full range of that. You know, a kid is worried, to a kid that has, has debilitating anxiety or depression. And, um, she's just a very powerful speaker and she's coming to speak to parents and kids on December 6th, which I'll show you in a moment. But wanted to show folks uh, some photos. So this is Lynn Lyons um, here, uh, both at O'Malley and GHS. And then she did at both places, she did a smaller uh, group session with teachers who opted in. Um, that is, I'll get to that. I'll get to those photos in a moment. Um, here's the social, uh, uh, social studies folks um, on the left, seventh grade social studies teachers working on unit redesign in O'Malley. This is speaking Spanish for students, so, so developing some basic language skills to help with our English learners. Um, 3D printing at O'Malley, so that you see um, O'Malley teachers there working with elementary school teachers on um, work to develop units with using 3D printing. On the right hand side, we worked with community uh, backyard growers joining us yesterday um, to help folks uh, work on how to build raised garden beds in their own backyards as well as the schools. Um, on the left, you see K2 teachers working on Wit and Wisdom and our English language arts curriculum. And on the right, I believe you see uh, Assistant Superintendent Pascarello leading uh, some teachers in learning more about recertification requirements for licensure, making sure they're up to, up to, up to, up to speed on that. Um, and then we did have some fun sessions uh, for, for, for staff. And um, Mary Berger, I see you smile. You appreciate this. This was uh, an impromptu band. Um, uh, that closed out the day to O'Malley. Um, you see singers and, and, and people reliving old, old past and old songs. You see, um, that's Principal, Principal Fusco on the bass. He never passed an opportunity to play the bass um, and put on his leather jacket, apparently. Um, and <laughs> Inside glasses. We also have, but this was really part of uh, you know, also community building, an important piece of, of schools and um, in any workplaces, folks make sure that they have a sense of connection and belonging. And so we had a bunch of sessions as well that, that helped build that uh, for teachers. So um, this is been, has been videoed by a number of people uh, and maybe on social media, but uh, we're not gonna put it on our, on our social media. What you don't see is all of the staff in the back of the auditorium enjoying every moment of it and all coming together and cheering. Um, it was really a unifying moment. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Just the type of thing you want folks to do. Um, let me move back. Oh, nice. Let me transition to Lynn Lyons. So, uh, We'd love to have your help in through your social media avenues and your networks to make sure folks know um, that Lynn Lyons is coming. Um, so I had the uh, opportunity to listen in and sit in on the high school presentation yesterday. And I think um, Lynn coming on December 6th is probably the single most important parenting education workshop session that I think uh, that folks should have right now in this time and age. Um, it's something I wish my wife and I, really me, I won't speak for my wife, I, I had 20 years ago, when my kids were much younger, it would have helped, helped me and helped them quite a bit. Um, uh, and it helped me avoid uh, some pretty common pitfalls. But she's just very helpful in terms of help, helping families, helping our staff understand what anxiety means, how it plays out, and the whole range of it, but also offering real understanding, real, real empathy, but then also real strategies on how to work with, with students or your own children. Um, very powerful speaker, very impactful. And we're gonna get help from our PTOs um, uh, for communicating this out, um, school team members, but just really wanna make sure we have a, a good turnout um, so folks can benefit from this great resource. Another piece to know about Lynn Lines is that she's been working with our, often what you have in schools, you have someone folks should show up for one day. And we've been actually working with Lynn for over a year. She consults with our cl clinical staff every month, um, every other month I believe it is. Um, that was organized and arranged by, uh, by Amy Cam. And so coming here yesterday, she actually um, really, for her so, so said it was like coming home and seeing a bunch of friends, you know, um, and which she doesn't often get that chance in terms of the way she works with schools. But so I really, uh, really value and cherish the way that Amy Cam and our clinical staff has, has developed the program with her and learning from her. And because of that, really supporting our students in more effective ways. So um, that's on December 6th, right here at high school. And then I want to go back O'Malley had a, a fantastic school dance last week. Um, 
and want to really thank the O'Malley st staff, school leaders, the PTO played a really big part in both the creation of it, but also the staffing and chaperoning. This was a very successful dance. No phones, no backpacks, and that really helped a lot. But also another thing, I mean, what you see here um, is some, some, of the, some of the photo booth. So there's also there's dancing, obviously, but also um, they had crafts and games in the hallway outside the, the, the uh, learning commons and also in the gym. Because um, not everyone likes to dance, so just hang out at a, at a dance, uh, especially middle school. And so kids had a lot of other options. And um, you can see on the left, those two creatures, they are, um, rumor has those are two of the assistant principals. <laughs> I shall not be named. Uh, and it looks like Ernie, Ernie and Bert, but, um, and then you kiss some kids just having a good time. Um, good, safe uh, time, really. Um, and one thing, you know, uh, we made sure there's no phones, and that helped on a number of levels. One, kids are really focusing on being with each other enjoying that and not being somewhere else on their phones. Um, and also helped that uh, we, we believe, or I, I, my, this is my inference, um, to talk to some folks that um, it just helped the, the kids realize that they wouldn't be photographed or videoed and then show, show them later at another time, you know? So, so that add, I think, a, a, a nice sense of, of safety for folks. So, but a huge success, uh, about 400, 400 kids or so. Yeah, so big turnout there. So thank you to O'Malley, PTO, and, and certainly the staff and leadership there. But not a, and the kids for being cooperative, safe, and having a fun time. Okay. Can I just ask I have two questions or of one, course. Question, one question? On that, when not being on, I mean, we know that this is a question. Like, if, if students have to leave their phones behind, how do they react? How do they react not having backpacks and phones? It didn't seem to be any problems. You know, I mean, so they're used to not having phones in a now. They've been doing it all year, you know, not having them out or not having them available. And so, and also, another piece that they did was um, they essentially had, had a permission slip. So they sent information home about how, how the night would run to, to families, and then got signed off, did read it, and the kid had permission to be there. So I think there's also, it wasn't a surprise to anyone. Right, right. Yeah, so, but I think it worked very well. Yeah, it was, it was um, both, in, uh, both um, parent leader, parent PTO leader, and also just the principals that had a very similar message about how well it went. Great. The second thing, just so you know, is I already saw today regarding the Lynn Lyons event that like pediatricians are, are putting it out on social media, not just Gloucester pediatricians. Oh, wow. Right. So I saw it go out from Garden City. So that's um, that's a big regional pediatrician's office. So just wow. to be aware yeah. that you might get or we might get a big, a big audience. Okay. That's good. That's well worth it. And that, that's um, part of the partners we have, you know, with, with, with Pediatricians, Amy Cam, and others like it makes sure people know about it. So that's great. Yeah, it's it's um, just just going to be a great resource for them. So that's great. And that's so, I'm sorry, Laura. Are you no, no. All set. Um, that's part of the. Uh, there's also a resource night that night. Is that? Yeah, yeah. So so at at the at the you know, at, at the high school that night, the resource night for you know agencies and partners and access to um, you know support and care. Um, and you can be organizing that with others as well, and that'll be, that's it. It's part of that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've already shared it, and I, I was amazed at the amount of people that took my post and shared it. Great. So it's just yes, really getting out there. Yeah, that's really one of the real, real, real strengths of, of social media. So yeah. it, can, it can really it can, um, just uh, push forward. That's great. Yeah. Well, that's coming on the phones. Um, my son went to that dance. No. Yeah. Um, and they were not allowed to so um, one of the additional things O'Malley is doing this year is asking for more student voice and the students were part of planning that mm -hmm. and they were part of coming up with the rules and the no phones was partially their idea. Oh great. That's great to know. Because they have an idea to Right. Yeah. All right, so then moving on, um, I'll hand things over to Ms. Pascarello to, to give us the end cast update. So, uh, oh, sorry, let me just say one, one thing on this, which is um, so we're going to, tonight, we're going to, we're going to do two things, and we're doing it very purposely this way uh, three to eight end cast update, as well as the three to eight um, professional development work we're doing this year. Okay, so what you just heard about, we don't hear more. Um, because those really, our, our, our performance and academic achievement is obviously very tied 
to the support, skill development, and training and, and, and collaboration of, of our teachers and all of our instructors, all our training staff. So that's why we're matching these. And then two weeks from now, same thing for high school, you know, high school MCAS as well as high school freshman development. Um, another thing, just to sort of sort of lay the land here, um, sort of lay the framework is um, it's a funny time looking at MCAS, and it has been for the last couple of years. And one of the things you'll, you'll hear tonight from Amy is, um, of course, the results and, and how we're sort of rebounding and rebounding strong in some areas and, and compared to state and rebounding, left, you know, not as well in, in a few other areas. Um, but also, you know, hearing about just statewide, the absentee, absentee, absenteeism. And um, that is clearly making an impact, um, not only here, but across the state on, on, on test scores. Um, so that's why it's a complicated picture right now. Um, but it's a picture for us that we pay close attention to, but also we sort of utilize as a point in time, but also, as you know, K to five, really look closely at your benchmark assessments and then really use those to guide instruction. And now do more of that at the middle school and begin to introduce it at high school as well. But that's, that's some of the assessment work that's for us more powerful, but every year, um, MCAS is a, is a good benchmark to see what progress we're making overall. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you've all seen on the news, MCAS as a state that we come out of a pandemic. Um, there's drastic changes, right? Um, so we really can look at this data and dive in deep, which I have. Um, but I think the best way to look at it is to look at it as telling the story. So we're looking at the road to recovery and we're looking at rebounding. And we are rebounding in some places really well, and in some places not yet. Um, and we, uh, we will, I will follow this with special development because that's to, to target the not yet, right? And to continue what we're doing well. So just to remind you, um, a full MCAS has not happened since 2019 for grades three through eight. In 2020, there was no MCAS. Testing in 21, we took like a half MCAS. Everybody took one session. They didn't do the full thing. Um, one student might have taken session A and the other session B. So it's not it's not as easy to compare to 2021 data because it wasn't a full test. Um, so I just want to point that out. Um, and so there'll be a lot of times I'm going to show you a lot of numbers. Um, we're going to look all the way back to 19 pre-pandemic. I'm going to show you some data in 21 as a frame of reference, but we're really looking at getting back to that 19 pre-pandemic is where our goal is. We're not there yet. No one in the state is there, but our goal is to go there. Um, so these are statewide assumptions. This is what the state has given us, or summaries, not assumptions, excuse me. Um, so in the 2022 MCAS shows some mixed results when compared to 21. So it's very, like I said, it's very hard to compare it to 21 data. Um, it's showing that math scores are increasing across the state. It's showing that some ELA scores have actually declined since last year across the state and science scores are starting to come up. We're going to get into our data in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> Statewide results are when they're compared to pre-pandemic levels, there's a substantial work we have to do. Um, but in literacy, um, that's a focus that we're gonna attack across the state and particularly here and we've already um, got some good headway here in Gloucester with um, an implementation of a new curriculum and pilot at the middle school. Um, and absenteeism is absolutely has still been a, a challenge, okay? Um, and we're bringing back student growth. So with the absence of consistent testing, it's been hard to look at student growth with MCAS data. We never gave it up as a district with benchmark testing, progress monitoring, we never gave up the student growth. But to look at MCAS and look at student growth, that we're able to start to bring that back now that we're being more consistently tested. Um, can you raise your hand? No, okay. I'm just trying to get comfortable. That's okay. <laughs> um, so, I just want to remind you of the basic standards for student growth. So it talks to you about, so SGP is student growth percentile. You don't want to be one to 19 percentile. It's very low. Um, they say typical growth is to be in the 40th to 59 or 60 percentile. If we're going to fill gaps and we're going to rebound from this pandemic in a, in a productive way, my goal, and I believe Superintendent Lemus's goal and all of our goals is we need some high growth. So we're looking for 60% growth or higher. We're not there yet, but that's our goal. We're, we are not 
we're, we're rebounding in some areas, but we have ways to go, okay? So when we talk about growth, I want 40 to 60, they say it's typical. We're looking for high growth. We would like to go higher, okay? Yes. Sorry, is, is the desire to get to 60% growth, is that to kind of get us back to? It will fill the gaps, mm -hmm. but it also continues to push students. So you can have a high achieving student that just stays high achieving, but is could have a low growth percentile because they're not being challenged and pushed to go further. Yeah. So that's why it's fun. It's nice to look at the growth percentile because it's looking at every child where they are and how much we're, we're challenging all students to learn and grow, right? So then we, and it's also, if you, when we look at the, the subgroups, in order to close the gaps, we need a higher growth percentile because they have to learn at a higher rate to get to catch up. And yes. just a quick follow-up: um, Are we gonna like are we gonna see how that growth is measured, or is it? I mean, what is, what is the so it's comparing last year's data okay. to this year's data, I see. and we're also going to see 19 to 22. I see. So I'm going to show you that. And us are metrics the same across the Commonwealth? I mean, yes. You know, so the growth the the growth data I'm getting from the state. Okay. I see. Okay. Good. Okay. For MCAS. That's enough of my smart questions. Hey, well, you might come up with some <laughs> So we're going to start with English uh, language arts. There's a lot of numbers. Um, I tried to shade them so that you can follow it a little bit. The darker shade is our 2019 data. It's the state in comparison to our district. And then in the middle, we have 22. And then on the right, we have, um, no, 21's in the middle. 22's on the right, OK? Don't start doing all the math in your head. I'm going to show it to you on the next slide. <laughs> okay. So if you look here, we see our comparison, our difference between the state to our, state to our district in 20, from 20, uh, 19 to 22. Here's from 22 to 21. What I want you to focus on is this last two, these last two com columns where we're comparing the, the change from 19 to 22. And what we're measuring in this is students who have met or exceeded the benchmark, okay? So any student who's met or exceeded the benchmark, for example, um, if we're, I'm gonna go back just for a second. In 22, 44% met or exceeded in the state and 51 in our district for third grade. Does that make sense? Okay, so then we'll go back here and I wanna focus in on these two columns and you can see that the state is 11 points lower than it was in fifth grade than 2019. So before pandemic. Before pandemic, they are 11, point, 11 percentage points lower. We are 16, so we are substantially lower than the state there. So fifth grade ELA, it's a concern. It's a focus for us, right? It's hard because we're folk with a lot of negative numbers. So you want to think you want to be closer to zero or in the positive is even better, right? Because zero gets us back to pre-pandemic, okay? So seventh grade, we also have a challenge of being lower than the state. But the news is not always, is not all red. So we're going to go here. And I want to point out that if we look at, the, at third grade, we took a hit when 19, uh, 21 came. But we are coming back faster than the state. So the state is still 12 points lower. We are only four points lower. Even though it's negative, we're rebounding faster for third grade. So that's a good thing. We are also rebounding faster in eighth grade for ELA. So this is a story of where we have to work and where we have to continue to grow because we're, we're on the right track. Okay? You with me? A lot of numbers. Okay. Yeah, but they're only double digit numbers. There you go. But I'm going into the negative, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, this for this chart, we're looking at subgroups, okay? And we're only looking at this year's data for this purpose, these purposes. So the top line is all students, state met or exceeded grades three through eight, forty-one percent. Our district thirty-seven, okay. So when we look in on that, hone in on that, that um, I'm gonna go back a little bit before we get there. 
I want to point out the gaps. So if we have 41% of all of our students, or the state is 41, we have 37% of all of our students meeting or exceeding. We only have 12% of our students with disability meeting or exceeding. We only have 14 of EL, 27 of low income, and 25 of high needs. And you can see that comparison of the state. Yep. Go okay. ahead. You no, know, this is just a clarification. I always think it's helpful for the people watching to explain if subgroups sounds negative. Yep. So I think it's always good to explain that that's a that's a state. It's a state mandated, but not state mandated state category. Right. And we track because we want to close any achievement gaps. And it's a category that um, is categorized by um, information we have in our student database, and um, we look to close any achievement gaps. And we're required. We are required to look at this. I just want to. It sometimes yes. comes across as in a negative way. So yes. Well, I, it's not meant that way. And there's some positives in here too. We're going to have some nice green circles. Yes. Um, also, in my um, some students could be represented in a couple different categories, right? Yes. So high needs is made up of students with students with disabilities, students low income. It's kind of it's a collection of all of them. EL students also, right? Okay. Okay. So our EL students are underperforming in con comparison with the state as well. So that is an area that we need to grow and really focus on. If you look, our low income students are doing better than the state, but we still want to get more equity going forward with our with overall. And then when we look to that student growth percentile over here, we're pretty close to the state's percentile, growth percentile. But like I said, we want to be higher. We, we, we are looking for more growth than that, OK? Um, there's a couple of things here also to add and just point out. We, if you look at all students, 37% uh, percent meeting or exceeding means grades three through eight in ELA. I guess I could know. You know um, and I want to be real clear about that. Um, the good news on that, and, and uh, Amy will get into this a little bit later, is the work we're doing with our new English language arts curriculum is really meant to address that. You know? And the work we did prior to that with Reading Streets helped move us along the path. And Wit and Wisdom and foundations, foundations rather than geodes, um, will take us to the next step. You know, and as you know, um, and we've, we've shared with you, um, you know, that the rollout implication of that is incredibly, uh, it's being very well done, very well led, very collaborative, and we have a lot of confidence that the principals are paying very close attention to it and will support it, you know, fully. Um, and they're both in their schools, but also across our schools. So our, our coaches are working together. Our, our, um, our um, elementary school teachers are working together through, through um, fresh learning communities and other ways through a leadership, leading, uh, leadership uh, team. Um, and then also, as you know, in terms of English language arts at, at, um, at O'Malley, we're reviewing that curriculum and we'll be adopting a new one by the end of this year. Um, and then also <coughs> the keys to literacy work, which, which cross literacy across the curriculum at, at O'Malley as well. So those are pieces that, um, that we're you know, beginning and um, that's to improve academic achievement, improve engagement, and deep learning. Um, and all that should have an impact on any way we assess kids, but also in the as well. And like I said, I have no idea if you have any data on this at all, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway. When we roll out new curriculum, is there any data that says like when we should start to see improvement? Um, I can tell you through experience. Yeah. Uh, typically, um, to fully implement a new curriculum, any new curriculum, it's about two years. Okay. Um, for the elementary ELA, for example, we are staggering implementation. So about half of our teachers are implementing it this year. The other half will implement next year. So by year three, we'll be all teaching the same curriculum. And we will start to see students <coughs> in to say um, a third grade classroom that has had the same curriculum and the prerequisite skills the year before and hopefully the year before that and as it goes through because um, it's a spiraling curriculum as we go through the years it will become more consistent and, and as the teachers learn and grow and that we provide professional development to support them and we really make the curriculum our own 
um, we'll start to see results. Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, I think that's my biggest concern, Amy, is other teachers were rolling out, and I'm a huge fan of Witten Wisdom, love it, huge cheerleader for Witten Wisdom, but are the teachers getting enough time from a professional development standpoint to kind of begin the process of, you know, learning how to implement Witten Wisdom into their, into their... So that's why we're course. doing it slowly. Okay. Um, that's why we're taking the two-year implementation. And I'm going to get in, I'll get into all of the professional development supports we have when we do the next slideshow. Um, but we are hopefully and purposefully giving them that time. Is it enough? That's our goal, right? They always can be more. <coughs> but um, our goal is to get as much support and professional development and uh, time for really collaboration because the teachers are the ones that are going to own it and yeah. learn it. Yeah. So that's our goal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to kind of revisit the whole progression, but through math, here we have our 19 data in comparison to the state, 21 and then 22. Again, I don't want you to get too hung up on all these numbers. Um, if you look overall, grades three through eight, 39% met or exceeded for the state, 34 for Boston. Oops. But when we go forward, I'm going to hone in on this change from 19 to 22. Um, and you can see fifth grade for math is also a concern um, because we are not bouncing back as fast as the state. Okay. However, we have third grade where we are bouncing back higher than the state. We have sixth grade, eighth grade, and collectively grades three through eight, we are coming back faster for math than the state was. So that's a celebration. Doesn't mean we're done yet. Laura? So, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember learning when we were in the midst of the pandemic, or as we were coming, or we're still in it, but um, that third grade, that there was a moment for math instruction going from second to third grade. Mm -hmm. um, and tell me if I'm misremembering this, where there were, there were the, because that's those are the current fifth graders now, um, where there were there were um, sort of basics that were being borrowed, right? Were being taught at the end of second grade. The kids who missed school, the end of second grade, had then were already behind for third, and that that was a gap. I remember that we've been looking you're at you're seeing right, and so this is that gap, um, and and um, so I'm. You know, I'm uh, encouraged to know that we already knew this, right? We predicted it. You predicted it. I remember Greg and others saying, this is a very hard year to lose math. Um, and that also uh, makes me think that having predicted it, you will have ways to. We are working. It. One, of the, one of the trainings this uh, yesterday was on bar modeling. Like we are working on it, absolutely. And was, was there a similar thing for seventh grade? Um, so math in seventh grade, it was ELA that seventh okay. grade is showing below. Okay. Math, um, they, they are not, we're not doing better than the state, but right. we're within okay. a point. So it's eighth, that's more. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for remembering that. Can you just come back one slide? Absolutely. I gotta go through all my an uh, animation though. <laughs> there you go. So, so I guess when I look at this data, right, meets and exceeds, it still just doesn't make sense to me that even the state is at like 50% or lower. Like to me, it just speaks to like, what, what are we doing wrong? Is it the test that's wrong? Is it the teaching that's wrong? I'm not talking specifically about our district. It just feels like there sh should be higher. I don't, I don't think you would necessarily have to have an answer to that, but it's just, it feels really frustrating to me to look at state data and still see only 50%. Right, and now that's the average for the state, yeah. right? So there are districts that are much higher, there are districts that are much lower. Sure. Um, so yeah, it, it's a tough test, but um, I still think we should at least be back to where we are, where we were in 19, but I am a little more optimistic than that. I want, I want to be higher. 
Um, and our goal is to be healthy. And our goal is to have a higher growth and to, to continue to, to work on this. And yeah, the, we can look at the tests and things like that too. Um, but we need to look at our students that are in front of us. And um, I truly think the growth and making sure they're growing um, academically, social, emotionally, just as being good humans, that's our job, right? And we, we're looking at the growth. Yes, so um, I know this is this today's presentation, but I um, in the past I know they gave out um, selected questions to districts to for, for sample, dis questions. sample questions so that you could start, um, you could see what was asked, how it was asked. Mm -hmm. and what the they released some questions. That we could, yeah, we could so and I point. assume that's yes. going to be part of the work to understand maybe certain pieces yes. of math that we either did good in. The so that's level. the work that's done at the building level. Yeah. And I'm happy to share some of those questions with you if you'd like. But this is the over yeah. overarching right. review for you um, and for the community. But the work that school levels are doing, they get into the released questions and they analyze them in our, is our curriculum addressing the standards that are being asked? Um, sometimes the language of MCAS questions are, um, they choose the best three answers and the, a student an chooses the best answer instead of reading the, so to even teaching that skill is something that we can learn from looking at those questions. That's something that absolutely we can do at the level. They, they don't want, I mean, I, I, I almost need some time to just process all this, but. Yeah, it's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of stuff, right. And, I, and, I, and one of the things that kind of hits me right off the bat is, you know, we kind of use the state, what the state's doing as the bar, you know, like, okay, let's try and get back to where the state is. I'm not afraid to set the bar higher, you know, higher than the state today. I want to beat the state. Yeah, right, exactly. That's, you know, and yeah, no, I, 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 sorry. No, that, that's kind of the, the, the gist of it. And I know I was, I was today I was reading uh, Superintendent Goals 2022-23. Goal number three, strengthen instruction and better content, general education and special education. Almost like, you know, that needs to be the, I'm not saying like this, that needs to be top of the list to say, what are we doing to improve the, the content of what these kids are learning? And what can we do to beat the state? Yes. To become better than the state. Absolutely. So, I, I, just, to, just to build on that, I, I, yes. And I think you, I, if you're not hearing that from, from me, maybe you need to hear that from me, maybe you need to say this in the bar. Yes. The state can match the state's not the goal. Right. Foster can, can uh, exceed that by law. Yep. You know, and and um, if we we're working to, 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 to go in that direction, I think the, our staff and our school leaders and our, and our you know, uh, district office leaders, um, I think are, are focused on how do we continue to deepen belonging um, as, uh, as, as you know, sound of foundation. What that allows then is then with high quality instruction and high quality curriculum and that folks are doing um, uh, it's aligned um, and it's uh, you know, working together to understand how to, how to teach that curriculum, then we can go further. Another piece on this, and, and this is just builds on, I think, Sam, you asked this question earlier in terms of timing. You know, another way to improve um, skills and academic learning, and which then you see um, impact uh, scores, whether that's local benchmark scores or MCAS, is through the interventions. You know, so the, the second dose for students, and that's some of the um, uh, investments made through the ESSER funds. And especially uh, one example you've heard about is at, um, at O'Malley. They were there, uh, I think it was the literacy, literacy intervention last year. They saw kids who were getting a double dose already in SARS 360 seeing the impact of that very quickly. Those students who were not doing as well, but weren't getting that interventions, you know, were, were sort of progressing, or the ones who were were press, progressing faster. Now at, at O'Malley this year, we have that for math as well. So that double dose piece, you know, it's such more time on learning. Um, as in, in addition to strengthening the instruction and teaching, um, for everyone gets the, the, the tier one instruction, um, that really helps as well. And so we're, we're able to do more than we ever have, both at the elementary level and the, and actually middle and high. Because we have English, English interventionist at high school as well. So um, those two pieces working together to what scores. And, I don't, and I'm not, I, don't, I certainly don't want to come across as sounding like, oh, you know, being accusatory or anything like that. I, I recognize it. I think we're in the best position now with the leadership we have and the 
teachers that we have, the educators that we have, to really kind of tackle this and say, okay, let's get to a better Oh, place. I'm competitive. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with it. Good. <laughs> and, and then not to be under under uh, values, the attendance piece. Yeah, yes. right. It's exactly. you know, huge. huge. It's, it is. It's important to not let kids fall behind. Right. Every day matters. Every day matters. To coin your kids. <laughs> okay. Um, so we did this. We're, we are coming back a little faster with math, so that is a celebration. Um, and then looking at the subgroups, and again, you said that looking at the state is 39% met or exceeded. That we want that higher as a state, and we definitely want Gloucester to be higher, right? Um, so that's our goal. Um, so I'm not happy that we're below the state by five percentage points, that we're gonna need to work on that. And again, our EL population, we need to, to focus in and give them some more supports. Um, we are slightly higher for low-income students for mathematics, meeting and exceeding. Um, and then the part I want to really point out is that growth percentile. Remember I said, who remembers how high I wanted it to be, 60? We have some ways to go, okay? So that's our focus. We really need to push our students to grow. Um, for science, is, there are no growth percentiles for science because it's given in fifth grade and eighth grade it's in their different tests. Um, so, but what we can say <coughs> is that we took a large hit, when it dipped 12 points and we are starting to come back in science for fifth grade and eighth grade. So those are good things. Um, we're not back yet, we need to come further, but we are on track. And again, that's still only we're equal to the state here at 43% meeting or exceeding. We should be higher. Yes. Just a question. I know that the FOSS um, science program, mm -hmm. um, what year does that, is this the first year of that? Um, that's a very complicated question. It's a simple question, it's complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a simple question, it's a complicated answer. But I'll try to summarize. We did adopt the FOSS curriculum pre-pandemic and we were starting to, and then we went into some remote learning, shorter days, social distancing, individual um, materials, and hands-on science right. was hard to do. Right. So it was very, it, we took a, a large hit. A lot of teachers went to other, some online resources. We used some mystery science throughout the district um, and some other or resources. Um, to cover the and to teach the topics, but the hands-on learning was hard to do when we were in that kind of a environment. Um, we are getting more, more back to normal, so class is coming back. Um, some teachers are all on board, ready to get back into that. Some are li liking some of the online tools, which is fine. They were effective. Um, they were effective because we saw some growth, right? Um, so we are working to bring back FOSS consistently, um, grades two through five. Um, I have one, one first grade teacher that is also implementing it. She asked to. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about this during professional development, and even you're going to hear about next steps for science when you hear about the BRACE um, grant that we received. So we got a lot of science coming, and the, the back to hands-on science is, is a good thing. I just have personal experience that that's a very, that's having a very positive, yes. um, that's very exciting for yes. students. And it was, it was hard to lose. I mean, we lost a lot of hands-on just right. collaboration in the last few years, but we're bringing it back. You see yeah. eighth grade, eighth grade is probably one of the places, I mean, sorry, middle school is probably one of the places where we do hands-on science the best. Right, yes. And I think this is the only spot where we're above um, MCAS performance pre-pandemic is eighth grade science. Okay. That's, that's really a culmination of those three years. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, how much time in a day is dedicated to science at the elementary level? Um, so there's not a lot of time in the day. Our days are short, right? And so it's tight. Um, we tried to have 90 minutes a week on science. Some grades, because of the tuning and things like that, are able to do it a little differently. Um, but the thought of the 90 minutes, teachers can do 30 minutes three times a week. They could do a 30-minute lesson, and the ideal would be a 60-minute lab, 
right? So they really could dive in from that hands on. And different schools do it differently as far as implementation, but that, that's the that's the goal. How does that compare to other districts? You don't have to answer too many. Um, yeah, I, answer, I, that's a, I think that's a curious, that's a question I would like to know yeah. is how are our elementary schedules um, relative to that's a districts? larger just larger question because you're also talking about amount of time, how long the day is too, right? Yes. So absolutely. that's a bigger question. Yeah, and I did find out at the conference how low our day is relative to many districts. Shorter. Absolutely. Yeah. And someone had seven hour elementary days. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we look at science by um, subgroups, and again, the state subgroups as defined by the state, um, and we focus on this year's data, um, we are looking equal to the state, but we want to be higher. Um, and uh, our EL students, again, we, we really need to help support them. Um, but students with disabilities were actually at, from, at a higher level than the state, also for low income findings. Those are good things. Um, and then our change, we are coming back faster than the state, so this is good. We're actually above our, our students with disabilities. And we are back to even with training students. So science, we're doing we're doing okay. We we want to do more than that. Um, so absenteeism, I went back and forth on what to share with absenteeism because there's so much. Um, and I had a slide, and I decided to take it out because they changed the standards. So if you go on Desi and look, chronically absent in 2019 and 2021 was 10% of the school year. You missed that, a student was chronically absent. For 2022, they counted it as 20%, but only for the year 2022. They're going to go back to the 10% next year is my understanding. So the data is skewed. Hmm. Um, and I think it's because on average, so many students miss. And they had to because of the length of the being out of school. And they right, because of quarantining yeah. because of um, close contacts we were still doing and all of that, they had to change. So th these are observations from the state about absentee absenteeism, but they, they apply to us too. So statewide students have attended less school over the past several years. The average student has missed 11 days in 2021 and 15 days in 2022. 18% of students missed 18 days in 2021, and 28% missed 18 days in 2022. I'll pause because that's a lot of numbers. Statewide chronic absenteeism for students in grades three through eight increased to by in 2023-22 by 138%, 41,000 versus 98,000 students as compared to 2019. 1.7 million days of missed school based uh, because of positive COVID-19 test cases in 2022. And this does not include the days that staff were absent or had to be out for close contacts. Um, 1 million other school days were saved as a result of state testing program. The state wanted to be positive there at the end, <laughs> just slide it in. Um, but absenteeism it is a problem. Um, and when you look to our plan for ongoing improvement, it's in that priority number one. It is something we need to really work on. Yes. So just, um, I was having a recent conversation with a parent um, who was asking what the school committee does. And one of the things I um, talked about was the work we did on the new attendance policy. And um, she said, well, how are you telling parents that? And I said, well, it's in the new handbook. And it's, she's like, you know, I don't know anything about this. So I, you know, I, you know, I just sort of took that the way I think she meant it, which is like, we need to know more. Parents need to know more about about the impact of chronic absenteeism. Um, and I think this speaks to like 1.7 million days missed of school because of a positive COVID-19 case is also like, it's 
parents, um, while they need to be educated, they also haven't had choices, right? Mm -hmm. Like kids are sick and families are sick. So I, I just um, sort of want to put in a plug to sort of start communicating more widely and more deeply about the impact of absenteeism, even understanding that some of this absenteeism couldn't be helped. So it's a delicate balance. Yeah, it's not a pointing fingers. This is a, this is a reality. Right. Students have missed a lot of instruction due to being absent or if their Sorry. teacher was quarantining. Right. I mean, the, these are things that were out of our control. Right. But they, we need to move forward and um, improve attendance. The quarantine restrictions have been lifted. There's a different guidelines we're, we're working under. So we are hopeful that we can improve that. I'm putting in a plug for some more communication. Excellent. Do I put in a plug for what? More communication. Yeah, which dovetails into my. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I said it in my cliff notes, a little bit off track, but I was so impressed at the school committee uh, convention when they talked about ways to communicate with parents and the use of animation, with voiceovers from teachers and students. It was off the charts, the hit rates that they were getting, you know, sending That's out good. these videos on kind of a, a dedicated YouTube channel versus emails about the student handbook, uh, check your book, you know, all that kind of stuff. A tremendous way to communicate and all developed by Sudbury School Committee and a gentleman that was a newscaster for years in the Boston area. And, uh, so we, we have to be more creative when it comes to communicating with parents. I know as a parent, I you know, was not the most diligent when it came to checking on the school communications and what can we do to improve that. And I think this is a, I can't think of a better example than absenteeism and putting that in some sort of animated video yeah. to, to, to tell parents about the dangers of absenteeism. It is something that attendance teams are working on the communication, reaching out to students that are, you know, at risk. Um, it is also something that principals have um, shared at Meet the Teacher Night. It's definitely, in, in, it's, a, it's like a drum they keep beating, um, but we need to beat it louder. Um, but it, it has been in Meet the Teacher Night slides. It talks, you know, teachers are to talk about it in conferences, those kind of things. So, but yeah, I hear you. There's, there's more creative ways and other ways we can work on that. Can I just, I'm sorry, just on that, but do they talk about it when there are kids who aren't in, in, the, in, the, in the yellow zone, right? I mean, I think that maybe teachers are talking about it when kids are getting close. Yes, or, but I think that when I said the principles that in the meeting the teacher, it was to, that's to everybody. But that's, a, that's one time, right? And there's more times they can happen, absolutely. Okay. Um, we'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to share my takeaways from this. I think there's a lot of takeaways, um, but one literacy. We really um, want to focus on literacy. I am happy that we are on it. We are in the process of implementing a new literacy curriculum at the elementary school at O'Malley. We are working at a, on an ELA pilot program um, to adopt a new, a new curriculum and get some more interventions there. Um, and throughout the night, you're going to have me hear me refer back to the plan for ongoing improvement. So what we're doing in literacy um, goes to priority number two, that's strengthening instruction, the tier one instruction for all students. Um, so that's one takeaway. The achievement gaps. So that's when I spoke about the growth percentile. I want, I want to see more growth. I'd like to see um, students, uh, us all grow and close some of those Achievement gaps as well, also part of priority number two, of plan for ongoing improvement. Um, some the multi-tiered systems of support. We've heard RTI before, this is more global, but that to strengthen that at the elementary levels, um, we are implementing it at O'Malley. Um, so that, that's a wonderful thing. We are kind of on the road there. Um, and then of course, absenteeism is a huge thing and we need to work on that. We have our attendance teams that are local at each school working on that. We have a district-wide attendance team that's working on that, and that would be go-to priority number one, that deepening the belonging and engagement for students. 
and this slide might not be necessary because we can <laughs> ask questions along the way. But if you have any more, I'm happy to answer. I remember what I was going to say. Um, this is just an aside in relation to um, parent communication. So my the emails that I get from Ben and from Talina all go to my updates folder in Gmail. They do not go to my primary mailboxes. And I don't yeah, know how too. many times me I've said, prioritize this, prioritize this, prioritize this. It gets buried. Emails get buried in my email um, in a different tab. I don't know why. But I'm just saying that because to to Bill's point that like I think we might still need to get more creative about yeah. how we're reaching out to so parents. We have updated our um, last Facebook page. Mike Gaffney has worked on that. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. there might be that might be a venue um, that we could really utilize to to give some more communication on and attendance and policies. Mike and I just sort of you know now that Mike's sort of up and up to speed and we have all the principles and you know I work close together. Um, you know, there's steps, right? And one of the steps we were just talking about is how do we do more, how do we get into some of the different types of communication? Video, for example, that means that, you know, that a place for the superintendent, for principals, for others, you know, you can use video. Um, I think we gotta develop our skills in terms of the, the animation in the video that Bill was talking about. That's, that's uh, I should see, I should learn more about that. Um, Mike and I should learn more about that. So, um, and then also making sure that, um, you know, that we're reinforcing the priorities really, showing the successes and, and, and really helping people understand the direction we're going. You know? um, and then there's the, and that's sort of like district-wide type of things. And then also, you know, one of the really um, powerful tools we have uh, is Kinbo. Mm -hmm. And uh, primarily Kinbo is, is used, uh, in the, the real native is, is text, to text. And text, uh, you probably heard at the conference, text are in many ways a much more effective approach. Um, in terms of communicating, because they don't get as buried right. as emails, and you can and you can link to, you know, website or websites or you know remind them something's in the email. One thing that I just heard anecdotally, some of our English learner families is that um, a text to them through Kimbo, which is translated automatically, um, you know, um, letting them know that an email has come from the principal, and that seems to um, be you know just anecdotally, just on a small level, yeah. seems to be a, you know, a new approach. Um, um, that we're trying out and, and might have some um, some real value. So uh, I hear you definitely on the um, on uh, you know, just trying more ways, and I think we have you know um, more of a team in place. Um, and actually, you know, probably one more person in most district chapter. Uh, so, um, but that's that's uh, so yeah, ways to go. Any other question? Uh, I don't want to take the absenteeism thing to um, too much, but are we at a is are we when will we at a when will we will we be at a point in this school year where we can say last year had all these requirements of people being out, and so therefore our absenteeism was X percent or whatever, and now this year you know September October November. And now it's December 1st, and we see a much lower because of the, you know what I mean? I just kind of want to. So we already are at a point where we can kind of dive into some of that data. Yeah. data. Um, so Mike Meadies has developed this um, data tool that is tracking data, um, absenteeism by school and by the district. And according to the new attendance policy, instead of waiting for, and that you all noticed you wrote the policy inside it, but, but this data, it, the, the data studio is showing us that we're not waiting for a student to have five absences. If they miss the first two out of four days, they're 50% and they're already flagged to watch, right? And so we are watching that um, and we are meeting as attendance teams. Some schools, the larger schools are meeting weekly, some are more bi-weekly because they have a small population or whatever the schools need. Um, but we are watching that. Um, I don't think we've gone back to compare to last year's data at this point. We might be able to do that, um, but we're watching it to try to intervene when students are getting flagged as possible going into the chronic um, tendencies. We, we are trying interventions, reaching out, working with families, offering support, whether it be a school of phobia, whether it be a medical condition, whether it be, I don't know what, uh, discipline or I don't know, but whatever the case is, we're, we have the attendance team and 
pathways to work with families to help them. But let me just add to that, which is on the school committee presentation schedule, December 14th, we have a, a tentative report from the okay. So, thank you. Um, but yeah, so that's when we'll give you an sort of update if compared to last year and this year, how it's going and how we did. But I mean, what Amy is saying, that that's the work. The attendance team is looking at you know, each school level across school, all schools, but we'll give an update on, on December 14th. And related to that update, um, who knows where we'll be on December 14th, but just as I think parents especially are hearing a lot about flu and RSV and everything else. I don't know if Jeff Parco weighs in because I'd be curious, you know, if there's a like flu, you know, if like tons of kids start to be out because of the flu, like I'd love some input on if we know that, like if we know that kids are being out because they're sick, kids are being out because they're at Disney World, like, you know, it's it's different. So I, I mean. We don't, we don't always know that. It's, 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 you probably know some of that more this year than before, but it's never been tracked before. So we don't have any historical data on that. But I mean, it may have some anecdotal data on that, but I know the nurses are tracking some of that, but it's, it's very, it's very, it's incomplete. But whatever we have, we can share. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm not done talking. <laughs> Um, so we're going to switch to so professional yeah, What's that? Yeah, yeah y'all can stretch and take a moment. Um, but we're going to switch to professional development. Um, now that you've heard who we are, here's where we're going, right? So this is the purpose of it coming up next. Um, reminding you of the plan. This is like a drum we're going to beat all the time. Plan for ongoing improvement. We want uh, to deepen students' belonging and engagement in school. That's the attendance. That's engagement strategies. That's all of those things. Um, we want to strengthen in instruction and better connection between general education and special education. That's that tier one instruction that's working with MTSS. Um, we want to strengthen student social emotional learning and mental health support. Um, Lynn Lyons spoke to that and a lot of other of our initiatives. Um, and priority four is to strengthen special education um, through improved coordination of service and specialized instruction. So just that's evaluation and goal writing um, so as we go through this, um, it's not animated, um, but I do have a little graphic. <laughs> no, it's just pointing out I need to find out how to animate it next time. Um, but it will point out that e what each is addressing. So the preschool is really focusing on priorities one, three, and four. They're doing an IEP boot camp, and they're talking about the brigands, report writing, IEP goal developing classroom accommodations and behavioral strategies. So that's the focus of professional development at the preschool level this year. Um, elementaries, this is just a, an introduction slide. We'll get to the, each one. Um, so wit and wisdom implementation. We are year one of wit and wisdom implementation. Any teacher who piloted last year was able to implement this year, whether they piloted wit, wit and wisdom or CKLA. In addition, any teacher that was of that grade level, because we wanted them to have peers to go next door and say, how did this lesson go? How can we better? We wanted that collaboration. So say a third grade teacher piloted wit and wisdom, their partner gets to also do it in that building. That's how we chose it. We also decided to have new teachers um, try it too, because it didn't make sense for them to learn Reading Street for a year and then come in for wit. So that was our deciding factor. So they, they are piloting. Um, they are working together as grade level teams. There are some PLCs throughout the district that they work together. Um, I know that there's a, there's a kindergarten, great, this um, Beeman kindergarten and East Gloucester kindergarten are really collaborating. They, they kind of was a homegrown. They really got along and, and go back and forth. So they're really supporting each other. That's great. Um, we have our literacy leader team. I believe there's 15 literacy leaders. We have every grade level represented, every school represented. We meet monthly to talk about how we can support teachers in their buildings, teachers across the district in um, implementing wit and wisdom. Um, our literacy leaders stepped up and many of them led sessions yesterday. And we'll get to that when I talk about November 8th. So that's great. And then foundations is currently K through three every school. We didn't half implement that. That's full in. 
um, and geodes, which is the, the literature that goes along with it, is fully implemented in grades K through two. Um, FOSS training, we talked about that. FOSS is back. Um, it, we are implemented in grades two through five. And uh, we have one first grade classroom that is, is trying it out as well, or implementing it as well. Um, and that is really, this is priority one and two because there's a lot of engagement, there's a lot of bringing students in, um, and it's strengthening that core curriculum. So, um, bringing two schools together, East Veteran School, that, there's a lot of professional development that has to go along with that. We have two communities um, that are coming together that have their own identities and their traditions. And to bring that together is very important and, and has to be done skillfully. Um, we also have two communities that had different teaching styles. So East Gloucester has traditionally been a platooning school. Grades one through five had one ELA teacher, one math teacher. Um, and Veterans has traditionally been a co-teaching school. Um, we're kind of bringing the best of both worlds together. Um, when the two schools go into the new building next September, they will be a platooning school one through five. Kindergarten will remain self-contained. Um, but one through five will be platooning. They have already decided what subjects they're going to be teaching. Um, and some grade levels at Veterans are trying out or platooning or, or being the, the pioneers of platooning in that school. And that's helping to bring the two schools together as well. Along with that, we are developing um, some, customizing some professional development to how can you co-teach within a platooning model? And you can. And so uh, Mr. Fusco and I and, and Ms. Lambert are working with an um, outside consultant to kind of give, and, and Ms. Provost, to really make um, that come to life and support that. That's going to be a longer professional development. That's kind of a bigger, bigger lift. Um, but that kind of professional development is going on now. Yep. I just want to make sure I understand. So the platooning model is where the kids switch for everything? Yes. Yeah, so um, there are four classrooms per grade level at the new school. At the new school. Um, I don't know if it's going to be left or right, but for the purpose of this, we'll say left is ELA. There'll be two teachers that teach ELA. Mr. Fresco might correct me and it's opposite, but right. Well, forgive me, I hope. You want to just use the example of East Gloucester right now? Yeah, just, so, use, just use East Gloucester. Well, I wanted to do with the four schools. I don't know. Four schools. Okay. I think, yeah, no, I think simple is good. Okay, simple is good? <laughs> okay. So we have two um, grade levels, let's say third grade, at East Gloucester. Ms. Hood teaches math and science, and Ms. Reed teaches ELA and social studies. Um, they each have a homeroom. The kids go to their homeroom, and approximately in the middle of the day, they switch. Um, they stay with the same group of kids, they have two teachers, um, and it becomes a real team community. So, and that's for every grade of these Gloucester? One through five. I'm a Beeman parent, so I'm yeah. accustomed to a different, that changes platooning, grade to grade. platooning means a little different at Beeman because there are some grade levels with three, right? Three, three classrooms, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and different grades do different things. Right. So it's gonna all be consistent Yes. at the new school. Yes. Interesting. Okay. And with four, it will be two and two. So they'll only have two teachers. Right? They won't have four. Okay. Yeah. That. It would be like if we were teaching pairs, I would teach math and you would teach ELA. And if Kathy and Sam, she would teach math and you would teach ELA. So your student would see two teachers. Four um, classes would see two teachers. Yeah, each class. Does that make sense? It's okay. I don't think. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and the sliding wall actually. In between, that's going to come. That's going to come very more. Inter interesting right. how that gets. That started. is going to add some more collaboration. And then science will be somewhere. Science is typically with in the math classroom. Yes, math and science. Okay. Yeah, Keith has his name. Oh, Keith. Sorry. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, that's just a new concept to me too. Of course, platooning. I've never even heard of such a concept. Can you speak up a little bit, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's just a new concept, platooning. So um, uh, that's quite interesting. So uh, is it, uh, what, what's, what is the, um, what is the, what is the, what I'm trying to say is, is it, is it to have specialized teachers rather than generalized teachers? Is that the? Uh... So the teachers are becoming more specialized because they, they focus in on one subject, yes. 
Um, it also gives a more of a community. The students really thrive in it at East Gloucester. I've, I've been there, it's been there longer than I've been. I was at East Gloucester. Um, and it's a nice model to be, have some flexible learning and, and support students with different needs. Yeah, so and then part of that is, I mean, what we ask, historically asked elementary school teachers to do is a whole lot. Yes. You know, all subject areas, especially as you get into the, the higher, higher grade levels, um, so I, I taught a self-contained uh, fifth and sixth grade classroom combined, all subjects. Didn't things go very well, um, <laughs> but, but just because um, we, we really asked a lot of them, and so in this way, the, you know, the, for a little bit of specializing, um, there's a couple things. You can really develop more expertise in that area. You're not spreading yourself you're, as as an educator so so thin. Um, at the same time, we find that it also, as as um, and you're saying, can really develop a community. You, know, you don't have just one teacher, but you have more than one, um, and that helps a, a lot as well. So, yeah. and social emotionally, if a kid has a tough day, they get a reset. Mm -hmm. They get to go next door, and maybe the afternoon's better. Um, it it is been it is we found it to be very productive for students and staff. And um, you see that done less in West Parish and Beeman, partly because. It's, there's three sections, the three classrooms per grade. Okay. So that's just, a, just the math doesn't add up as easy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's all right. It can, it can happen certainly in lots of ways. Yeah. But it's not quite as natural thing. Just a quick follow up. Seems like in West Parish, from my, my personal experience, there's um, some, some, some uh, specialized instructors uh, visit the classroom rather than the kids leaving the classroom, like a math instructor. Yeah, I think those are more interventionists yeah. than classroom teachers, yeah. yeah. Or oh. Title I teachers or those kind of, yeah. Yeah, previous association, intervention is right, yeah, a, a variety of folks who are pushing into classrooms, provide services or additional support or additional instruction. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, and at O'Malley, we have four um, topics I'm gonna talk about. So they are talking about UDL, Universal Design for Learning. It's really about brain-based learning, and um, they focus on engagement, representation, so why we're learning something, what we're learning something, and then how. And it's really giving choice to um, students. Uh, not everybody learns the same way. Not everyone can display their knowledge the same way. They're doing a lot of work with Katie Novak, who is an expert in the field. Um, she's come to do staff meetings with them. We've done some online trainings with her. Um, and they're finding ways to get, uh, to create their lessons with more engagement um, and action and kind of thought process and shifting the load of learning to the students versus the teacher doing all the talking. We want the students just to kind of have some productive struggle and, and, and really think about the information they're, they are learning and to digest it themselves. And so that's the goal of this. Um, they also are working on literacy across the curriculum. Um, literacy does not just have to happen in your English or reading class. There's literacy that can be done in science and social studies and so forth. Um, so they are working on having common language throughout the, dip, throughout the school. So if they're taking notes in science one way, when they go to social studies, they don't need to necessarily do it another way. They, they collaborate so that they're having the same literacy goals throughout the press of And then, of course, the um, pilot at O'Malley, they are piloting three curriculum, which is a lot in one year. Um, they are wrapping up Wit and Wisdom this week um, and moving on to Amplify ELA um, is the next one. And then after the new year, they'll be using Study Sync. Um, something amazing about this pilot, the teachers are being really thoughtful and <coughs> into the curriculum, but they're also, there's some student surveys, they're getting student feedback on their experience with the curriculum, which is a lovely addition to kind of get their viewpoint of what's happening. Um, so once this, the, the curriculum is selected, which we will hopefully be done uh, on or around February vacation, we will be implementing one of these three um, are all teachers piloting? Um, or is it? So there are seven? nine teachers, and there's one that is leading, so she's doing some of the lessons, but eight of the nine. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just sort of thinking, we talked about the like golden thread between 
like every single school, right? Mm -hmm. Grade level. Um, and I'm looking at these different pilots. So like we've decided that Wit and Wisdom is going to be at elementary school level. Do the other two amplify and study sync? Will those be sort of a nice transition? That's what we're going to look for. Okay. Yeah. So uh, a quick read is Wit and Wisdom Elementary, Wit and Wisdom Middle School, right? It's not that simple. Right. Um, the curriculums are designed for different levels so slightly differently. The needs are different at each level. Witnessism might be the curriculum <coughs> for middle school. It might not be. But we will. We do want to be thoughtful of that it transitions nice from one to the other. And that's something we absolutely can do with any of these programs. Um, we want to make sure we meet the needs of, of O'Malley. And um, we want to make sure that it is, is it's able to be implemented properly, right? So it might be the right curriculum. It might not be. Um, there, you know, if, at the middle school, they have blocks. The timing is different. Um, Wisdom's a longer, you know, 90 minute block versus a uh, 60 minutes. That's hard to do 90 minutes and 60 minutes. It, it might not be the right fit, but we're not ready to decide that yet. Um, it is part of the puzzle and we're looking at it, but we, it, we do want to be thoughtful about the transition from elementary to middle. We also want to be thoughtful about the transition from middle to high school. So for example, if one of these cur curriculum teaches a novel that is taught currently taught at the high school and it's the one that we adopt, we're going to want to then work with the high school and say, hey, we need to figure this out, right? But we're not at a point to make that decision yet, to make those changes because we haven't, we've only piloted one so far. We've got two to go. And uh, I look forward to telling you how it goes in the spring. Okay. Um, so last year they did the ELA really deep dive on what the curriculum was and how it was working. And now they're piloting. We are now doing that deep dive with math at O'Malley. So they are, we, we started a committee. We're going to be meeting shortly to start looking at um, big ideas, which is their current curriculum and see if it's meeting the needs of the students there. If it's something that we need to in, um, investigate to possibly pilot something new. Um, we are collaborating with the state with the MTSS um, program, and they're supporting us and bringing some interventions, more interventions into O'Malley. They started some last year, and we're going to just strengthen that program. Um, so that is also some curriculum development that we're working on this year. We're about a year behind the, the rate of the ELA. So, um, I can't quite remember if we have someone in the role of in that curriculum role. Yep, Kate Robertson. Okay. Um, she started this year. She is the curriculum coach for both math and ELA. Um, and she's fabulous. Great. Yes. I don't think we can. Um, nope, we're going to have to have her come in at some point. Actually, she, a she, a she yes. is a panelist if you want her to say hello. <laughs> I didn't tell her I was going to put her on the spot. I'm going to put her on the spot. Don't put her on the spot. I wasn't planning I, on putting her on, her on the spot. The spot. But I, we would love to meet her when she is prepared. Two meetings. <laughs> it's coming to present the same improved and um, update and also December 14th. Yeah. I imagine um, if I ask nicely, that uh, she'll come along. I'm sure she will. Um, she has quickly um, gotten to know the staff at O'Malley. She has quickly um, earned their trust, I think. Um, I meet with her and with regularly, and um, she's really a wonderful addition. We're just so, so glad to hear someone's in that. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. someone's in that role. and. Um, we're going to get her connected with the elementary coaches as well. Um, she's been in touch with one or two of them, but just strengthen that bond as well. Yeah, we're, we're all positive. Good, love that. All right. Um, so we, this one? What? Let's we'll skip this one. Um, Let's skip this one. I just think that we did it. And we, you did it. Right? Yeah. Hey, you stole my thunder. <laughs> Get used to it. Um, but I had some thank yous to give with it. Can I give those? Yes, please give thank yous. Okay. So, Superintendent Lamas stole my thunder on this. I didn't know he was going to give such detail of yesterday, but it was fabulous. But I do want to give a little, uh, some thank yous. Um, I want to start out by um, thanking all of the instructors, many, many instructors who led sessions. We had over 70 sessions. Um, Amy Cam and Katie Provost <coughs> organized some outside providers. Amy Cam was the one who got the Lions to come here. Katie Provo got a lot of um, some special ed providers to come in and help. Um, but more fabulous is I want to just highlight our staff, teachers, parents, administrators, all led sessions. They taught, they put, got themselves out there. They were amazing. Um, who doesn't want to learn from their peers? 
and the courageousness that they had of going out there and doing it, I really am, am so impressed and I really want to thank everyone who stepped up to do that. Um, most of the sessions were led by our own staff, and which is awesome. Um, I want to thank the coaches who were critical in the planning and, and out just getting the whole day run smoothly. They helped with the food for the snacks in the morning. They were directing people where to go, where their sessions were. They were helping people with sign up pages. They, were, they had a, literally a help desk set up. Um, I want to thank Brittany Holmes, um, who works at the district office, working with all of the teachers to make sure they get PDPs and credit for all their, the, um, the courses they take. She also helped me lead a session. She was fabulous. She actually really read it, led it, not me. Um, I want to thank all of IT. Um, Alex Mason was running around O'Malley getting adapters and fixing things and Ethan, they were fabulous. I want to thank IT for everything they did. The custodians, food service, provided coffee throughout the day and tea. The nursing staff put on a flu and vaccine clinic for all staff on site. Um, Mike Gaffney came and documented the day, so you got to see that. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Matt Plesko's band at the end of the day <laughs> that brought us all together. Um, also happening yesterday at the high school, James Cook and his team were amazing. He had 20 people volunteer to share one of their lessons to get feedback from their peers. How courageous is that? Uh, amazing work that they've done. Um, and especially, and I'm gonna miss them, Greg Bach. It was his day. He did all of it and he was amazing and I don't know. Next year, I think I might just put on a video and say that's what I did on the <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to live up to it. Um, but uh, he did awesome. Um, I got an email immediately after. I won't say it's from, but it's from a staff member. Just wanted to say that today was amazing. It was a it was a great way to recharge. All of the workshops were valuable and inspiring. The rock band at the end just made absolutely made my day. Well done for all of the presenters and to me and Greg for putting it together. Awesome. So that's great. I Thank you me. didn't take that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> no like that. All right. No, and also just, just to reiterate, I mean, this really has been Greg's group of work oh, yeah. for the last number of years. So obviously one one part of his work, but a big, big piece. I mean, it took him so much to organize people and cajole them, convince them, but also support them. He does so well organize it. It, it was it's smooth and seamless. Um, and he's really the orchestrator of that and has been so. Uh, and, and after, as Amy says, just a huge team effort. Yeah. And after a pandemic and feeling so heavy, people were skipping out of there and happy and inspired and recharged. It's good. Huge. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, special education professional development, that goes to priority one as far as engagement strategies, but also priority four is mostly are all special ed. We're streamlining the um, evaluation process, the goal writing, de-escalation strategies. Um, we are working with communication devices, um, the autism curriculum. And then we also have some social emotional training that goes to priority number three and one with um, with belonging, um, Superintendent Lemus talked a lot about Lynn Lyons. She's amazing. Um, we're implementing the Trails curriculum, uh, Project Adventure for three levels with some SEL support um, at the middle school. Um, we are attending a comprehensive threat assessment uh, training, which is not as uplifting, but we still need to do it. Um, and then we are in partnership with um, the youth for some SEL online trainings as well. And I got to the end. Anybody have any additional questions? Or would every time you guys present on professional development, I'm just so jealous because I talked about them. <laughs> yes, you learn. So really learn good. all of the things, yeah. the lists every year. I'm just like, oh. I'll go play bass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to be. Uh... Debbie Downers. <laughs> my daughter sometimes call me, but um, do you think that one of the things that they talked about at the conference was, you know, teacher burnout, you know, uh, people leaving the, the profession? And this sounded wonderful. I actually talked to some teachers today, confirmed everything you just said. 
great professional development day. Is there a way to, I mean, so good that I'm thinking, well, do, do we need more of that type of stuff and can it fit into the, into the school year? And I mean, I, I think back to what's in manufacturing, I ran a place where like they had probably 80 people on me. And I knew that if those 80 people came to work, like I'm feeling very good about, you know, a stressed or burnt out, that my day was going to be a nightmare. And I was basically going to put out fires for the entire day. Um, so I always kind of get back to that is all the stuff about, you know, professional development is good. It's going to be better if the people that are administering that or delivering that are really feeling good about participating and being employed by the Boston Public Schools. So I, I kind of just get to that is, hey, what can we do to enhance that or to grow that out in some form or fashion without, you know, understanding that there's a whole, I, I that's think, a big question. Yeah, I think, you know, Phil, I appreciate you raising it. It's probably the um, single most important question that we face in public schools right now. You know, teaching has always been an incredibly difficult job. It literally takes all of you, takes all of your being to be a great teacher uh, every day. You know, um, you know, it takes your intelligence, it takes your humor, it takes your experience and wisdom, um, it takes your humility, it takes your, um, it takes everything, right? Um, and, and these days, it's more exhausting than ever for any number of reasons, for a whole host of reasons. Right. Um, and so, you know, where we, and, and the we is pretty collective because it, it can't be just administrators doing things, you know, because that doesn't work. As, as Amy said, one of the most powerful pieces about yesterday was that a lot of staff led these things, and a whole, whole range of staff led, 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 led these, these sessions, you know. But folks have got to um, have a sense that they can be successful. I think they've got to have a sense that, that it's clear what's expected of them. You know, um, they got to know that 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 people care about them and they care about each other. You know, they have a connection to each other. Um, you know, and then they also another piece on this is folks don't typically mind learning if it's relevant to what they're what they're doing. You know, I, I, one of the reasons I left teaching a long time ago was because the professional development I was getting had absolutely nothing to do with what was important to me. I was tired of being treated that way, very honestly. You know? um, so yesterday, I think, is a good example on, on a number of levels of, of the types of things we can do, we do do, we can do more of. Because um, the learning is really relevant to the classroom. It's really relevant to the challenges folks face on behavior or anxiety. Um, it's really relevant to um, connecting, you know? Um, the backyard growers, the, the rock band, the, you know, the, you know, there's, there's also the knitting, and just things where like, people have time they, they connect during the little important learning stuff, but they also connect in, in other pieces as well. And that's crucial. So I'm not trying to say we know all things right, but it's a, these are the types of things that really matter. I think. And, and, and doing them well like that and doing them with, you know, in collaboration with you know, teachers and educators and school secretaries and IT folks, um, as opposed to doing it to folks, matters a ton. And, if, and, and I think that's one of the things, you know, one of the legacies of Greg Bach, we all need to remember is the way that he has helped us um, develop a process for, for creating yesterday, you know, or our half days. But also, how we consider and adopt curriculum. It always involves teachers in a really significant way. You know, it's always relevant to folks. It's always listening to folks. You know? And I think you know that's sort of sauce, the special sauce that is um, is crucial to. Helping to feed people, helping to keep them engaged, helping them know that they're being effective. Um, but that ongoing listening, work, and collaboration is uh, taking cool. So it, it, it's incredibly, incredibly hard um, questions, honestly. You know? um, but you know, I, I do think that we have half days as well. We have more half days than a lot of folks, and I think those you know need to continue to be you know help. And I think we did a pretty, pretty good balance. We, we didn't hit, hit it perfectly at all. During the pandemic, where we backed off on things, you know, it had had some half days where people just, you know, did what they do. You know, so I think being in tune with that makes a lot of sense. Um, but you do have to be conscious always, even in normal times, that we're not, you know, overloading folks. And that's why we talk about just unsimilar wisdom over the course of years. You know, 
Uh, that's why our trails curriculum in terms of social emotional learning is really being led by our um, by our adjustment counselors as opposed to classroom staff. You know? So we're trying to be thoughtful about that. We don't get it right every time, you know? but we need to look, make sure we're, our, our ears and, and eyes are open so we can adjust. I, I hope that's not just a lot of talk, but it, it, it's it's something that I think our principals, our administrators, our teachers, uh, our union leadership you know, really think a lot about. Yeah, I'm very concerned about. So, no, and I appreciate that. I just it's it's become crystal clear to me. You don't have to be certainly not the smartest guy in the world, but understanding that it the teachers are the foundation of delivering what we what we do. And if they're not in a good place, then you know it does, the foundation is kind of there's some problems. Yeah. I mean, another small example of this is, you know, another part of the foundation is our school secretaries. You know, and we've done very little. And this is historic. This isn't just Gloucester. Historically, districts don't do much so, uh, support and professional development with them. You know, and so yesterday we had a session led by Cody Marshall um, for school secretaries on Munis. You know, one of the key pieces of their op of their operations every day that has changed recently. But in, in order for them to feel like they can do the jobs well. They really need some learning, so we provided that. But then also, even and then the next step on that was had a great meeting with Kathy Hurd, um, the, the principal uh, uh, secretary here, and um, uh, about um, just ongoing you know, on, on upcoming half days. You know, what else can we you know, support them with? You know, and so that's another place: listening to folks, learning what they need to help them do the jobs better, um, and making sure you can they get they get some of that. That's another place I think. That's another example of how listening to folks and then supporting in ways that they need is part of um, connection to and, and feel like you're successful. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate the answer. I'll just follow up by saying, you know, I've been on this for a while. Um, professional development now looks very different than it did when I first got on. Mm -hmm. um, much more, uh, you know, everybody heard. And um, discussed what this idea of what's relevant and what's helpful. Um, and so it really has evolved to a very productive, exciting kind of um, you know, way we approach it, and way you know, kind of the menu item of some teachers can sign up for things. Um, so it really is a more collaborative way, but also I think the quality um, and the relevance of everything that's being delivered. Here, um, the outside speakers, it really has, has reached the place. Again, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, the other week, or I'm not sure which meeting was, but very recent, at the end, Amy said, I didn't really say anything. So, What's that? We, a couple meetings ago, or maybe oh. last meeting, said, I didn't really say anything on meeting. I'm like, That'll change. <laughs> so now, then you made me talk the entire time. <laughs> so thank you very much, Amy. That was very nice to meet you. Work on on that. Um, so my goals. All right. So you auth copies of these. Um, can you just send this down to Sam? I don't think Sam has to do that. I just get copies. Oh, that's right. There you go. Okay. I give you two. Okay. <clears throat> Share my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's show a couple of things and then we can go more in depth. So uh, So, uh, talk about the plan for ongoing improvement. Again, linking my goals to the plan for ongoing improvement. So, priorities again: deepen student belonging, engagement in school. Priority one: strengthen instruction and better connect general special education. Priority two: priority three: strengthen student social emotional learning and mental health support. And priority four: strengthen special education to improve coordination of services and specialized instruction. All of that done well over a number of years leads to deeper student learning, improved academic, academic achievement. And our GHS graduates prepared for the next step after graduation. Okay, you keep hearing about this. 
tonight very purposefully. In the budget process, you'll hear about this as well. The unplanned fund government improvement. Uh, my goals, as uh, 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 you know, have you seen, as you've seen, are tied directly to um, the, uh, the the plan for ongoing improvement. The goals that the principals and I are working on, their goals are tied very directly to the plan for ongoing improvement. And uh, the school improvement plans will be tied to the plan for ongoing improvement. Okay, um, just as yesterday's program development had, had those strong links as well. So. Uh, so this is what you see in terms of um, in terms of my uh, my draft summary. Um, I'll just I'll, I'm gonna zoom in here in a moment. Let me just show. So um, goal one is different than the uh, goals two through four, two through five. Sorry, mirror exactly the plan for ongoing improvement. The first one though is leading for the long term. That's really one of my main responsibilities. How do I lead in a way that helps keep us focused on, um, helps, do, helps us keep doing day-to-day -day work well, but really also take a, a longer term um, focus in terms of how do we build our progress. That's progress in student belonging, progress in uh, student learning, and prog progress in student academic achievement um, over the long term. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, goal two, again, aligned with the plan for ongoing improvement, deep in student belonging and family engagement. So this is the work that I'll be doing with our leaders um, and making sure they're making clear identif identifiable actions, uh, increasing family engagement and or student engagement, um, the student voice, student choice and leadership at, at our schools. Goal three, strength instruction. So, you know, strength instruction and um, deepening student learning and academic achievement is always, you know, the, the number, the most important work here. But there are many pieces that go into that. And that's why we always start with student belonging, right? Because without students feeling connected and, and, and um, understood and welcomed and loved in their schools, they don't, they can't learn or it, it impedes learning. So, but anyway, goal three about strength instruction. And again, this is the work that I, I, will, I will do and do in coordination with many others on uh, leading instructional improvement uh, across all of our schools and making sure that we're collaborating in a way um, that makes sure that students, you know, a larger number of students um, are receiving engaging high quality instruction. Uh, they're getting supportive interventions and enrichment every day. That again, results in measurable student improvement and student learning and academic achievement. Um, and then goal four, again, aligned with the plan for ongoing improvement, um, student emotional learning and health, mental health support. So the work that I will do, um, and we'll get into specifics of all of these in a moment, on supporting overall well-being of our students by assessing, analyzing and, um, school culture, and then um, making uh, adjustments um, uh, you know, um, based on what we learned from that from those assessments. We've been doing a number of surveys for quite some time um, on student culture and student belonging, um, but haven't quite had the systems or structures in place to respond to that and really analyze it deeply, continue to sort of thing. So that's something that we're working on. And then goal five, uh, just the work that I will do supporting uh, Katie Provo and our school leaders in making sure that we are shift, uh, you know, growing and developing and making sure our systems for evaluation, um, analysis, IEP development are um, stronger than they have been in the past. So um, a couple of things about this, I've talked about um, how it's tied to the plan for improvement. Uh, on the bottom, you'll see at this point, uh, Desi's, Desi's standards, those are the superintendent evaluation standards and how um, each one links to certain standards. Um, as we go further along in the year and get more in my evaluation process, I'll identify specific indicators that the different goals uh, support within those standards. Um, and then, uh, um, because the intention is that when I'm giving you evidence of progress on these goals, that you'll have enough um, information to make um, assessment across the entire rubric, which as you folks know from prior years is uh, lengthy. <laughs> um, yes. So I won't. I won't um, go into. You you read this. You see this. The, the point tonight is to have you ask questions, have you clarified things, and also give me feedback on it. Things that you, you know see too much of, or don't, or don't see enough of, that sort of thing. So I won't go through. But just to give you and others who are watching sort of the basics, the leading for the long term. This is about uh, finalizing and really beginning to operationalize through your plan for ongoing improvement. It's all the work we're doing in East Veteran School. Um, and continue to bring uh, veterans and East Gloucester together. That's everything from um, 
uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the sort of the people work. Okay, we're getting to the facilities and capital plan work here as well. Um, there's also the building work around these veterans. Um, living for the long term is also about facilities and capital planning. You know, how do we make sure that our that we have the long term viability of our school facilities? Um, and then also operations, specifically operations that we're that I'm going to really support this year as our human resources department. Um, one of the things, um, Bill, another part of the answer to your question is, you know, our outreach, recruitment, hiring, and onboarding. You know, um, those all feed into its retention. You know, um, and certainly it's a more competitive environment these days for getting school staff, and so we really have to start shifting and improving our um, all, all levels of that, particularly outreach, recruitment, hiring, um, and safety, security. Um, always, uh, uh, you know, always um, new developments on that. And one of the things that, that um, Amy mentioned earlier was our CSAG training, um, as well as there's also cyber cyber threats as well that we're doing. So we'll get more information about that. Um, is it helpful if I stop after each one and pause and see and ask for questions or clarifications? Okay, thanks. Um, in relation to the recruitment. Uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are, what the committee's thoughts are on specifically stating sort of um, a goal around diversity in recruitment and hiring. Yeah. Well, a couple of things are really important about, um, you know, our staff and their staff reflecting our students, you know, race, language. Um, I think we, ref so, so those are two, two important pieces that, that, you know, to, to me, but also I think to our students or stuff. Um, uh, another piece, which is interesting, which we never talk about, is um, I haven't actually ever discussed this, but I just thought of it, is that you're know, reflecting your students. All our students are from Gloucester. One of the ways you reflect your students is if you have people from here, from the community. And, and people don't actually talk about that as an important piece of hiring or, or, or staff. But, um, I actually I would like to say that, that that's actually, in many ways, a really powerful piece, you know. I think that's one of the reasons that we need to have you know, the pandemics because for so many folks you know, were born, live here, you know, and tied to here. Anyway, that's sort of aside. So the area for me that's the highest priority there in terms of diversity and hiring is language. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you know, uh, that doesn't mean that other other areas are important, race, you know, cultural, um, also just you know, diversity of staff in terms of people coming from different places, different areas. Um, but the thing we've been really focusing on is um, is folks who speak multiple languages. Um, and we've done actually quite a good job of that recently. And we can share you know, data later in the year, and that'll be part of probably my evidence. Um, but we have you know, a number more bilingual staff now. And even just this year alone, I think we probably hired you know, two or th at least three, three or more. Um, so, and that's you know, tied to the fact that um, our community, but also our schools is you know, growing in terms of Spanish and, um, and Portuguese. So that's an area uh, for us that's really important. Another piece of that is um, pipeline. You know, um, it's challenging to um, to have uh, you know, folks move from other places to, to any to any new school system. Okay, that reflect the population of the schools that live there. It's not hard thing to do, um, but you can build from then. You know, and certainly there are a lot of families here who speak speak, speak multiple languages that we could access, and we have multiple. You know, entry position, entry uh, ways into employment in classroom schools. There's obviously teaching, there's paraprofessionals, there's bus drivers, there's, there's secretaries, there's food service, there's you no know, um, uh, new supervisor. So there's there's a whole gamut of, of ways that we can tap into folks who live in the community, um, whether they have degrees or not. Um, that could be uh, part of our you know efforts on on hiring uh, multiple staff. Hope that helps. It does. Thank you. Any other questions or clarifications or suggestions in this area? Okay, great. Just moving on, deep in student belonging and family engagement. So um, at uh, O'Malley and Gloucester High, really important. They're making real uh, important steps. You actually, you've heard some about them tonight. Um, and make sure students have uh, more sense of belonging, more leadership, more choice, and more voice at, at both middle and high school levels. Um, you know, uh, everything from being involved in creating the dance to um, being involved in uh, uh, running the community meetings at O'Malley. Those are some, you know, just two examples. But uh, supporting folks to make sure we get those done. That's a really high priority for both, both these those schools. Um, and then um, 
Another area is making sure that uh, Gloucester High makes, in my support of both the principal and, and um, our uh, director of uh, school, school counseling and operations, um, and also uh, Career Book Tech, uh, make sure that we're taking the initial steps to really work with students from the time they're in eighth grade all the way through high school, that they're sort of identifying what their pathway is to leading after high school, what their next step is. Um, and that's a, that's a guidance effort, that's an instructional effort, that's a communi communication messaging effort, but that's uh, an area uh, in terms of blogging that um, is really important that I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I've really set as a, a high priority for my work. Um, increasing family engagement in the school community. So that's everything from working with our, uh, pre our elementary school and pre-K school leaders um, and also parent leaders. So we're apparently in a meeting this morning and last month it was all about uh, really, really focused on um, ongoing efforts on um, family engagement and specifically building engagement of families who typically do not participate in uh, school events or school activities and sort of thing. So working with uh, our elementary school leaders as well as our parent leaders. Um, and another area of that is um, uh, continue to work with um, families and learn from families who are opting out. So we'll be launching, as I think I mentioned, a, a survey for folks who who've moved from uh, our eighth grade and didn't didn't continue into ninth grade at the high school and learning from them about um, uh, the why and what is it about the Los Angeles schools that you like or don't like or saw or didn't see that fit for your child or children. And so that's another area we're reaching out to learn from families um, both in our district, but also those who opted out of our schools um, about what they perceive as the strengths and what, what areas they need to improve it. So, um, and then the other piece is uh, just supporting our efforts on reducing chronic mm -hmm. absenteeism. I want you folks to hold me accountable that we make progress in that area, not only in our actions, but in our teams, and also the results. Um, and then as we talked about earlier, just communication outreach, ongoing work on that. Um, so all this sounds great. I just want to put in a plug is I think I have four. Um, just that our, our community continues to become more and more diverse in ways that are apparent and not apparent. Mm -hmm. um, at my bus stop alone, right? I have a family from Nepal. I have a family from Guatemala. I have a, you know, so there's a lot of people here. Um, and so I just want to, you know, I know that the different buildings are doing this, but just sort of for all these cultures to be seen, um, for all these children to feel, because belonging means that the child from, you know, Southeast Asia is also being met, yeah. uh, even though there may only be one or two. Or so I just um, I see the ways in which um, for every single child, especially in a culture that has such a dominant culture, like this community has a dominant culture and then lots of smaller cultures or different cultures. So I just want to put in a plug that we really work to see all of the cultures here. It's really, really important. You know, um, we talked just in, uh, with some of the parent leaders this morning about this notion of um, diversity, access, um, inclusion, and belonging. And just to, I just share a sort of a framework or really an analogy with them. So um, in one level, you know, and this is simplistic, but I think what makes the point is, you know, diversity is that everyone's invited to the party. You know, and they understand the invitation. Okay. Um, I guess you get it that you understand it and they know what's happening. Right? Um, so I have this here. Um, equity is that everyone can attend. Because we've reduced barriers, typical barriers, you know, when they're talking about a school event or that sort of thing, it might be childcare, it might be transportation, you know, it might be um, a timing, that sort of thing. Um, uh, inclusion is that folks are there and then they know they're welcome and they know that they're people are glad that they're there and part of it. Okay. And then belonging is that uh, all, all sorts of folks are actually involved in creating. Because when, they, when you have a wide variety of folks creating things, whether that be how parent conferences or, or good example is the, is the O'Malley, um, the O'Malley um, dance. Because the PTO was so involved in that, it actually changed how that was, was done and made it much better. You know? So when you have more folks actually creating the event or the party or the event, um, a more diverse range of folks, it makes a better, better experience, you know, better place. So that's just one framework, one, one concept, you know, one approach, but it helps sort of like 
put some concrete pieces to you know, one of those big ones. We, right. And that's that's one way we can help our, our schools and also our parent leaders to sort of think about that. But because um, when you go in and you know you're welcome, you're happy to see you, it's a whole different experience. Mm. Otherwise, it's a whole different experience. Everything is everything comes from that. Right. So I have um, a question on measurable. How do we measure something? See, you know, there's a lot of obviously very good work, and some things can probably have some data that says we have this and now we have that. I'm sure a lot of it doesn't. So um, I guess that's kind of flesh through the, the plan for ongoing improvement. Um, I think those measurable pieces should be incorporated where we can. Yeah, and that's and knowing that goals are not necessarily. Um, I know in the past we have <coughs> goals that in year one we were hoping to kind of lay the groundwork. In year two we were hoping to do this in year three. So um, it's not necessarily. What is this year's measurable? But what is when is it going to tell us whether that's year two or three that we kind of made progress and gotten to a certain point? And how are you measuring? Right. right. Like just, just even that, right? right. Um, yeah. So we're we're both at the at the dish, at the um, leadership team, just leadership team, but also the smaller teams. Um, so Katie Provo is leading the team. Um, uh, to, to, that's part of operationalizing the plan for the improvement is. Identifying um, the timelines we have, you know, but uh, the measurables and, and what the outcomes and what the you know, specific measurable goals are and how we measure. So, so you'll see that as the year goes along, uh, that fleshed out, and that's the same sort of evidence that can be used here as well. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's the, the plan isn't done. I mean, what we're going to do is identify, but how we're going to measure it isn't yet. Yeah, it's probably going to work together. Okay. It was, uh, it's funny that you brought that up. Kathy and I appreciate it because I only put a check mark next to one thing is and that's back to uh, goal one. I, I put a check mark next to identify deliverables, timelines, and measurements of progress for the opponent yeah. like, And I'm kind of, I'm, since I've been on the school committee, I've become more of a data person. I've never been that way my entire life. I've always been big picture. As long as I see some progress, I'm fine. But um, that certainly is important. And, and what does that look like? But I, I think you've also explained that. Then. Um, yeah. but, but, but that's exactly right. That's the work that hasn't been done, hasn't been completed yeah. yet. But that's exactly speaks to what Kathy was asking. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. That, that bullet you see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I, just to revert back to the conference for a minute, there was a gentleman that was the director of uh, inclusion at, in the Cambridge Public Schools. He was, that was his job. Yeah. Um, because here I am as a 60 year old guy that hasn't had to face any of that type of stuff my entire life. I was like, well, that's kind of a weird subject. By the time he was done speaking, I was like, yeah, boy, I got a lot to learn on, on that particular end of you know, the spectrum. And what, what can I do in my own self examination to say, you know, do I do a good job of making people feel that, that are different than I am, making them feel included? And, all that kind of stuff. So I, and I think that's a community effort. I don't think that's just, hey, the superintendent said that, let's let's roll that out. You know, I think it's it's, it's a process for people and I think it's uh, something you gotta kind of work through yourself to get to that point where we're, we're all more of that bent than maybe we were previously. So if that makes any sense. No, it, it makes a ton of sense on both things. But one, in terms of just, you know, learning yourselves or as ourselves, right? So Amy and I are participating in a um, MASS sponsored um, program, um, which is on um, uh, race, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, and the reason that the two of us are doing it is for us to learn more about it and about ourselves and about our own biases and our own approaches, but also learn some skills, you know, um, and then, then to figure out, you know, what uh, what pieces of that fit with the work we're doing. You know, um, I will say this: that some of the latest thinking around issues of race, equity, and diversity, and inclusion is, is a lot about belonging. You know, belonging. How do you support a wide variety of you know of all students? How do you support them not only in academics but also in mental health? You know, and, 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 and uh, social emotional learning. But I think um, what I'm pretty proud about is that some of the most important pieces of that work are embedded 
very clearly in our complaint on voter proof. Um, and I think the other piece you mentioned is you know, how do we all, our teachers, our school leaders, myself, you know, school leaders, um, ask that question of, especially classroom folks, classroom teachers, right? Um, what what am I doing, or what more can I do? To make sure every student in here knows I care about them, knows I believe in them, um, and that I'm taking them for who they are, not who I think they should be. You know? But those are that seems obvious and natural and normal. But human beings don't. It's hard for them to operate that way. You know? So, but that's so that's an important question, Bill. Is, is how do we you know ask that more of ourselves? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I just want to add sort of this this nuance to the lying of, of like of truly trying to understand people, right? And so, um, and I say that because in the work that I do, I'm often sort of faced with like not quite understanding maybe something specific about a certain population, and but I still am required to provide them with support, right? And so I can't ask that person to explain to me what I don't know. I need to seek that information out myself, right? So like that would require me, and, and I'm, I'm using just myself as an example, but as like a district as a whole, right? Like so the teacher doesn't quite understand something about a specific population or um, identity to really seek out that information and ask for support. And that I think is just, step one in helping to help somebody feel true belonging and understood um and it just takes some humility on our part to be like i don't know really how to support you and i need to learn more but i'm not going to put that burden on you to teach me i need to do that. and so i think that that's to me just like the most important piece of this is like recognizing that like there's so much that we don't know that's okay you just need to do the work to figure that out that, you know, that's not easy work. That, that sort of learning is not easy. Uh, we definitely have to you know, take our kids where they are and, and really try to understand where they are, where, where they're coming from, and, and different backgrounds, that sort of stuff. Because they need to know that no matter who they are, they need to care about them. They need to know that every single day, you know, for every single adult that are um, because Because then they can learn. And some kids, listen, some kids don't need that. They just, uh, like, I, you, know, you know, I, I can walk in a place and assume that. You know, I had that privilege. You know, not every child does. Um, so we have to make sure that they know that from us every single day. Um, goal three. So uh, this is about, and this is this is the most important stuff. Where it's what everything leads to. You know, so um, as I've said before, you know, strength and structural leadership. So again, that's how the work I'm doing with, with our school district leaders. And that's through the goal setting with them. That's through the work we do at our, at our leadership team meetings. Um, that's through the work I do with regular school visits. Um, and then also making sure that um, I'm supporting the work and we're putting in place the work around non coding curriculum review, which you've heard a lot about today. Uh, that's across all levels, obviously. Uh, continuing the work we've been doing with elementary schools, deepening the work we've been doing at, uh, at, at GHS and really you know, launching the work in a, in a real way at O'Malley. Strength inclusive practices. So this is just some beginning steps on that. On the strength, and that's just uh, putting in place a leadership team that will look at inclusive practice and figure, figure out what inclusive practices are for Gloucester. Okay, really defining that. That goes to the notion of you know clarity and what's expected of folks. Um, and then um, and just this sort of goes into some of the questions in terms of continuing to deepen our, in sc uh, our school district support for English learners. Um, that's continued to prioritize and hire bilingual staff. Talk about that. Um, <laughs> translation support. We've added more this year, and we'll document that for you. Um, and then the other piece on this, and this is, will be a three-year process, is you know the, just like we've done curriculum work and instructional work in uh, at, you know ELA and math at O'Malley, at ELA and math in middle school, and a whole bunch of stuff at high school. We're going to be doing the same over the next three years for English learner education. That begins this year with tiered focus monitoring process. Sorry, tiered focus monitoring process from the Department of Education, um, and so supporting that our team is you know, doing that and make sure we get that done. Um, and then we're going to, in the upcoming years, um, addressing our curriculum instruction that, especially for newcomers, that's the area that um, we need probably just more support for our teachers, classroom teachers and EL teachers. Uh, when a student walks in from you know, Nepal or 
or Bolivia or um, Spain, you know, and they speak no English, how do you begin with them? That's a really difficult moment for a teacher, unless they have some real strategies and skills and we have some good support and critical support. That's an area that we will work on so beginning that process to get that. And then um, talking about student social emotional learning and mental health support, this is a really about, for, from my standpoint, um, supporting a, some specific areas, um, stuff, stuff that you've already heard about, um, but it's making sure from my standpoint that some things are happening. So that where I mentioned earlier that we have, we do surveys, we do um, analyze, we do assess how students are doing in a variety of ways, but how are we using that to impact uh, school culture and student belonging and improve that. Um, how, how we're making sure that we have systemic me mechanisms for identifying students who are in need and maybe require additional target support. Support, we do that very well um, in terms of the academic learning um, and our you know, support and uh, launching last year, piloting this year a little bit more um, just uh, uh, with Amy Cam's leadership. Um, and, um, and then um, you know, how, how, to, how to assess students for those needs and how, to, how do we give them support Part of that is this last piece, which is continue building partnerships with community agencies. So we're not doing all of that, but we can help. We're better suited to connect uh, those students or families who are in need um, with agencies that can really provide them support that happens outside the school. Um, in some ways, this uh, goal is support Amy Kim and her and her great team across schools, and um, stay out of their way to some degree, but also really make sure that um, that they know that. Um, it's important we get these things done or we make progress at all. That's, that's a big piece of this. And in some ways, um, the last goal, goal five. Can I, can I oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. On that? Yeah. Um, so you talked about existing surveys. Yes. Would it be possible for you to just send us, just share an example? Of oh, yeah. The yeah. Surveys you're yeah, about. a couple of things. So so we do a variety of them. Um, and O'Malley, for the last number of years, has been doing a survey three times a year. I don't want to say both, both of really the MCATs, right? Both of the MCATs? Yeah. But they do a student survey too. Right, you know, so you know, on top of that, you, they do vocal, the vocal survey, which is tied to MCATs. It's like sort of at the end of MCATs. Um, we do YRBS every two years, and at our next school meeting, you'll see a bunch about that. Um, so that's another piece. Um, so yes, yeah, so we can share that. But yeah. We'll share the YRBS questions with you next, next time, so, um, many of them, and then the other surveys we'll share, share in time. Yeah, because um, you know, we're just thinking about so many of us are uh, have kids, or like this is my first year without a child at school. So it's just really um, just useful, I think, to understand what what other families at different levels of the district are. You know, how we're engaging with them, yeah, yeah. and you know, just share it the email to the. I think I think that's another, another piece about it is not only have the school work with the data, but make it public, so you know, so we know and. And we can then see progress over time. Um, the last piece is just sort of the blocking and tackling of how do we really improve and strengthen our, our, our um, sorry, um, our special education processes. So, and you've heard this evaluation eligibility processes, um, strengthening our IEP development. Um, and then the last piece is more instructional part, and that's really sort of my efforts while we were working across um, a number of areas um, where I'm focusing my support is in um, the work that um, Katie Provo and principals are leading um, and social education, education, education staff are leading on autism and development, development delay programs and, and supporting those and strengthening those. Um, you see we're sort of focusing on pre-K to two and nine to 12 on that and then support school district, district efforts to strengthen our therapeutic programs specifically at Beeman and O'Malley. So that's work they're doing already um, it's up to me to support it and make sure that we make you know, progress in those areas. And that's a, a fair bit of that is um, clarifying expectations, clarifying structural strategies, um, and then supporting the folks in, 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 in taking those on. So um, again, this in another way of describing this is make sure I'm supporting uh, Katie Provo and, um, and her team and doing some really important work that will help us on a number of levels um, in those situations. So. So it's a lot of stuff we're already doing. It's not new stuff. And it's a question of whether I can support and, and our folks to make sure that they um, can get these things done um, across, you know, uh, we have a really good team. You know, 
Um, and the most important piece is that you know, no small group is doing way too much. So yes. I think it's, it's, it's across lots of roles. So, so I have a general approach to what you look for. Thinking yeah. of somebody, um, I realize this is all part of the important work that you do and that we are doing with you know, the whole school district. And I wonder, has your mentor looked at your goals to say maybe you should be, um, maybe that it shouldn't have everything in your goals, knowing, I mean, we know the work will be happening, but um, I think the more specific or, or key things that I think we can evaluate on might be, um, like, is this too ambitious for us to, um, I mean, goal, goals should be achievable, yeah. right? And if you've got 20 really high priority things in here, I don't want anybody to say, ah, we only did 15. When 15, any 15 would be hugely important, right? Yeah, sure. So yeah. I just want you to think about that yeah. and think about how other superintendent goals, um, you know, is this, is this articulating a really ambitious picture, even though we know the district of ongoing plan for ongoing improvement is very ambitious? Does that all have to be mm -hmm. all of your goals? So that's yeah. So to answer, to answer that. your first question for the first time, no. Uh, uh, my my colleague and coach has not really looked at these, so I think it's a good it's a good step for us. Also. I appreciate that. Um, and if, and if she has um, some suggestions, she will make sure I hear them very quickly. Okay. Um, and uh, that's helpful, yeah. Because no, it, it's definitely ambitious. I get that clearly. Um, you know, the, the challenge here is, as you folks know, like this is not all my work. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's from my role, how do I help make sure it happens? You know, but there might be just um, too much of the right. So today we get the episode makes sense. Well, I was sort of going to piggyback on what you just yeah. said and what Ben sort of just recognizes. It's a lot of ground to cover and. As you just said, it's not all you. But when you've got a team, you can give them a lot of credit where credit's due. But I have to agree with, um, with the chair that uh, maybe it is a bit too much because you're right, because I could just see some folks in the public say, You only got 15 out of 20. I mean, what a schmuck. I mean, so, I think, <laughs> so, I, I'd be, so I'd be interested in what your, your mentor has to say. So, that's yeah, something that you refined a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is our first. Um, preview of, of the draft and so um, that would be my feedback to you. I mean obviously everything is important. I mean, everything will have a huge impact on students and families but um, you think about that before we talk about it again. Yeah. And if we make adjustments I'll, I'll make sure what they are I'll, you know, make sure you guys are clear. And just because they come off does it mean they're not being done I guess is my point. So I'm more principal and, and, uh, and, and that person was saying, you know, because we have something similar to them, you know, not not as extensive as this, but very aligned, you know, the, and that principal was really saying that how much they um, appreciated having, you know, real clarity on them, like this is the thing they got to pay attention to. So there is, um, so not, I, your, your point is very well taken and it's the right point to make. Um, and in some ways it's kind of nice to know, like, yeah, we got to keep moving on these things. So. Um, but I think it's a, a lot. So I think there you go. It's a lot for us to evaluate you on. True. <laughs> As well. <laughs> so there might, be, there might be a practical aspect of this as well. Trying to yeah. throw us off the trail. We're throwing a lot out there. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we will move on. Their um, subcommittee reports is next, and there have not been any subcommittee meetings um, since our last meeting. Um, under action, we have a couple um, exciting grants, um, at least one of them. Um, uh, approval of the grants, and I move that we accept the Brace Cove Foundation grant for the O'Malley Science Center in the amount of $200,000. Second. Um, and I that so we are all about particular great generosity and um, progress. So this grant uh, is an amazing way to bring all of the fabulous things that are happening at the Humay Lee Science Center and bring it out to 
um, third, third grade through eighth grade. Um, we talked about bringing back FOSS and we talked about not really having enough time to do FOSS the right way in all of our classrooms, right? So this is an effort to kind of help with that. Um, so this grant has five goals. Um, to extend the quality of professional development in science in grades three through eight. And what that means is by hiring a science coordinator for three through eight, um, classroom teachers could go after school, say on a whatever Thursday, third grade is going, and they can try out the lessons, they can prepare the lessons, they can really dive in deep and have support from the science coordinator of how to bring that back to their classroom. So that's one goal. Another way is to utilize the Science Center for field trips for experimental. So a fourth grade classroom could go to O'Malley into that science center, which I toured very recently and is so amazing, the things they have in there, um, so that they could go in and use the 3D printers or they could go in and see the bio lab or the slime lab. Um, so that money will help with that. It will also help, with, help strengthen our connection with local um, science throughout the community. We have a lot of community partnerships and it allows that. Um, it will strengthen some college and university partnerships to have some college students come in and really be mentors and help out in the program. And to build our own internal mentors of high school students that could help out some middle school students and in turn middle school students could be leaders for the elementary students that come up and really strengthen that science um, connection. Um, it would help with bring, giving some elementary students experience at O'Malley, just to generalize transition part two, because they've been in the building and they've done some science experiments there. Um, it's really a tremendous opportunity um, to also you know, help support our elementary school teachers who have so much on their plate and their time is so tight um, to, to fit in science and do more than just fit in, and to do it right and to bring on the hands and on and maybe bring the kids into the lab so that they can have the experience there or come and just train as professionals and this money will also pay for some time, you know, after school time for them to go and do that and then go back to their schools and bring that back home. So um, it's very exciting. It's a new and creative kind of innovative way to expand science and support it internally. Um, so we're really excited that this grant can do. And I noticed um, Amy Donnelly is, mm -hmm. she, do you think she would like, I know she's very she integral to, um, so she to has, all that goes yeah, on. Yes, yeah, she knows all that happens in the Science Center and I don't know if she wants to speak or not. Amy, do you, would you like to speak? She just joined us, I think. She is. She's on mute. I'm, I'm unmuted now, hello. Thank you. Hi. We can hear you. What's that? I said we can hear you well. Oh, great. Yeah, so this is really exciting. Um, this this Brace Cove grant, um, Mr. Hurley, he from Brace Cove approached Greg about an opportunity for a grant. And this was something that was on Greg's plate for a few years to you know expand the use of the Science Center as a professional development place and a place for a community to do science. So um, we work together with um, our engineering specialist to write this grant and yay, we got it. So um, <laughs> really excited about this opportunity. We, we have a great science community at O'Malley. Our teachers learn from each other. We model labs for each other. We um, support each other in, in all of our endeavors. Um, our engineering specialist is like the Peter Pan of science and will make any lab happen that any teacher wants to do. So expanding that model to the elementary school is just another opportunity to, to, to move that all forward and we can all be doing science together. Great. Who do we thank? So Greg worked with, you said it was, um, what's that? Amy. Amy Donnelly, yes. Greg Block. Greg Block, and Dave was Brown. it? Dave Brown. Dave Brown. Dave Brown. Mm -hmm. yep. And Tina Ramos helped, Tina helped Ramos. draft it. Mm -hmm. um, GF also supported in terms of like, you know, thought leadership and, 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 and connecting with Grace Cove. Grace um, Foundation. Uh, oh. Not me. 
Uh, yeah, Amy, do you know anything more about either Amy about the Brace Cove Foundation? So um, that's, I think, what Laura is saying. Because right. there's somebody we can. We, who, I mean, it's a huge grant. It's a huge grant, and we want to give huge thanks. So the Brace Cove Foundation, um, the Hurleys are the the people that approached us. I can get the information for you from them. Just want to express our gratitude. Yes, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's, yep. it's so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Greg? I had met with the Hurleys in my office and uh, I should get a like check, whatever it was, he made his money and, and they moved across and love it here. And they, we had thrown a few ideas at them for little grand options. They want to do big stuff. Yeah. And this is an example of the big stuff. So um, well, we, they are a great asset. And, uh, here you go, as an example. Wow. Wow. I, I will say this is that um, part of uh, uh, securing grants is the, is the connections relationship you make with the folks who are making the grants. Yeah. And um, Amy Donnelly re uh, really, really did represent us so very well, first of all, but also really clicked and connected with the folks at Brace Cove. And, and so her work, her work over many years, but also her work in, in putting together this proposal with Grant, obviously, but also that connection that she made in terms of, and their, you know, faith in, in our team um, has a large part to do with getting this grant. So thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, no more questions? Okay. Thank you. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Weeson. Yes. Jefferson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. Berga. Yes. Okay. Passes excitedly unanimous. Yes. Right. Thank you for, for speaking, Amy. Great. Um, Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of the night. This has been great listening to everyone. The the energy and the excitement of all the things that are going on at the schools has been great. And it reminds me a bit of the, the quote from, was it Alice in Wonderland and the Red Queen and having to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. And if you want to get anywhere, you have to run twice as fast. And that's what it's been like <laughs> at this school for the last 20 years that we just keep running faster and faster just to stay in the same place. So this is, feels like progress and it's exciting. So yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have a second grant from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for fiscal year 2023. Um, grant number 222 slash 325 targeted assistance grant in the amount of 30,000. And I move that we accept this grant. Okay. okay. Um, so this is the targeted assistant grant from the state. Um, it is going targeting both O'Malley and the high school, 15,000 in each. Um, and it's working to um, support the initiatives that they're having. There are already some, some, some curriculum work, lesson redesign. Um, we are going to have uh, Carol Gregory come in at the high school and do some work with um, continuing with their lesson design and development, and how to coach that to be even more um, impactful in the classrooms. And um, we're happy to have a little extra money to do that. Yeah. Any questions? Maria, roll call vote, please. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Beeson. Yes. Jefferson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. And Mayor Verga. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so next order of business under action is approval of the addendum to the Foster Teachers Association contract regarding temper temporary change to the sick bank language. Um, ben? Uh, so, no, so, uh, sorry. Um, what, well, I'm not sure what the question is, because you vo voted on this and you considered an executive session and this is just about the public vote. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So we voted in executive session to um, allow for um, use of the sick bank with COVID related COVID-related reasons. Um, and just a, just a quick summary for, for, uh, for the folks who are listening. Um, it, um, it sort of acknowledges that um, there's still a requirement for, for um, quarantine um, and that it particularly is um, thinking about um, newer staff who may not have, you know, or have not accumulated sick days 
um, and maybe uh, and may need them, and it allows the sick bank the sick bank a sick bank process um, to be sort of invoked, so to speak, um, to consider whether or not a staff member could uh, you know uh, could could be granted um, up to 15 sick days during the course of the year um, because of COVID related illnesses and uh, absences. And something similar to what we did last year. Um, the change this year is that the process is better, it's more well defined. So there's a little clarity on both our side, the administration side, and also the administration side. Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. so for the uh, clarification, these are sick days donated by other members of the union. Right, right. These, these are sick days we're making up. The sick bank you know, process is something that, that the, you know, you, it's a you know, long standing process where, um, Sick days, sick uh, days are donated by the members. They have a sick bank of a significant number of, of those accumulated. Um, and the process is, you know, basically the process is um, a member comes, an employee comes to the sick bank and um, and the sick bank, you know, which is two, two union members and two school group members, um, you know, make a decision on that on a case by case basis. Okay, we have a motion. I move acceptance. Second. Discussion. Okay, seeing none, roll call vote, please. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wiesen? Yes. Chairperson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. And Mayor Verga? Yes. Motion carries unanimously, 60. Uh, okay. Um, uh, next item is discussion and other communication on your business. East Gloucester slash Veterans Memorial Station Community Update. Mr. Now will say East Veterans. Oh yeah, yeah. right. Well, Sorry. Updates. Uh, yep, gotta do that. Um, Mayor Berger, do you want to um, give the, the latest news that of uh, what Sue Egan, Sue Egan? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we did the, uh, the P F. What's the project, acronym? Project funding agreement. Project funding P F P F A. I signed the other day. As we, as we all know, the the lawsuit was uh, thrown out, and so we're able to move along. We got all Sue and Egan got all the final paperwork together. I signed it. We're good to go to start submitting invoices for reimbursement. All right. So there you go. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Thank you. And they're still building. And they're still building the school. school. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a school building committee meeting tomorrow night. We do. And we'll give folks a little more detail update. And and then we'll have pictures. In the next meeting, yeah, yep. yep. And also, yeah, pretty much on a weekly basis, we're up. We're there, there's a weekly update section on the building building uh, website, and um, and uh, pretty much that, that reports go up every week, you know, which just sort of gives up the rundown of you know, what's been accomplished the past week, what's been what's being accomplished the upcoming week. You know. But yeah, we'll show those photos as well. And I noticed driving by the like a retaining wall seems to have gone yeah. in. Um, I guess another update related to this in an invitation. So we, the administration is going to be presented to the city council here at November 22nd meeting with updates related to the East Bend school, what's going on with the the, the, uh, uh, the move of Mato's over to Green Street, what's going to, what's the plan for East Gloucester school site once we're done. And if you could sort of come and say as of today, 22nd, here's what's going on at the, the, the building. Okay. Yep. So. And we need to be there for the O'Malley uh, mm -hmm. as well. So that's great. Yeah, I think that's really good time. Great. Yeah, we good city council meeting. Yes, we were competing with them tonight. I don't know who got higher ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson's tomorrow. Yeah. Sam. Okay. We're good with none. Um, so I have been approached by a number of parents, and I would include myself in sort of that concerned group, um, just about the, uh, the options that are available for school lunch, particularly at the elementary school level. Um, and I realize that a lot of this is probably out of our control, but I think it's worth having that discussion publicly so that um, the community can just sort of see what we, and the committee can actually have a conversation about what we can actually do to make some changes about just sort of the, um, how healthy the options are or not. 
Um, it's pretty staggering when you look at the nutritional facts on the website, um, what we're serving the kids. And I realized this is like, I have friends in Manchester, what's happening there, it's not just us. I think it's just sort of a bigger conversation, but I think it's a really important one to have. So that would be referred to the building and finance. That's one of the topics under that group, right? Um, I don't know, actually. Huh? I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know if it was more that we just needed to have food service come and just have a conversation with us about, like, this is how the process works because it's a state-funded program. Yeah, so you want to understand what um, Martha Jo Fleming has for guidelines and requirements. And like how we choose our food. Or is it even a choice? Right, like I think there's just lots of questions about how much control and choice do we have um, in terms of how we choose. And tell me if I'm correct, but I, I share this, but also, and, and do we as a district have any I mean, like Sam said, we may not have much control or any control, but where are there places where we do have any input? I mean, from the way we food service is managed and, and the, the choices that are available. The choice, <coughs> it's not about management. I think it's just about content. But I just, um, does the Gloucester Public School District have any options in what we serve students? For, as for school lunch, or is this all um, sort of handed down to us by the funders, basically? Yes, yeah, so, and also looking at more nutritious food options, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and like what control do we have yeah. Yeah. as a district? Right. Understanding how it's done and, and what options there are, and you know, yeah. other options for more, more, more nutritious, um, uh, other, other more nutritious options. Yeah. Um, I'll figure out where that can go. Yeah, yeah I yeah. don't really yeah. know. Uh, the, I just want to remind everybody next Wednesday is, um, is the ceremony for the Sawyer Medal Awards. Um, Who's speaking on that one? Yeah. Yeah. She's on the program. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, no, you're on the Last year we like sort of divided it up, so yeah. I wasn't sure if we had a. Yeah. We had Really two this year. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Is all right. there is there a school committee meeting next week or just being a just being just being a before the soil thing, right? Meeting at five. Yeah. And then no meeting. And sorry, Mel starts at sorry, starts at seven. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, the calendar of meetings is not correct, right? Yeah, that's um, good. It is. Yeah. And our next meeting is Wednesday, November 30th. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Hudson. Yes. Ms. Weeson. Yes. Chair President Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Bonino. Yes. yes. Mayor Verda. Yes. Uh, we have now adjourned. Thank you. Anybody who's still in there with us. Good night, everybody. Good night, Keith. Good night. Good night. Good night.